All um, right. Well, well, this is it. it. We're, We're here. here. We're, We're live. live. We, we are on the air. air. And, this and this is, is another week, week of Coco, Coco Talk. Talk. Uh, Coco, Coco Talk, Talk 12, everybody. How, how, how are we all, all today? today? People we'll of the Earth who are watching us. People, people of the Earth, earth and other planets who are joining us. us. Uh, I'm so, so glad to have you all here. Our cast of characters today starts off with Barry Nelson from the Wild East in Florida. Richard Cavell from, is it Cavell or Cavell? How do I say your last name, Richard? Richard's in the UK. And we have David Ladd from Parts Unknown uh, from Medical Experimental Laboratories and other uh, genetic research. Uh, Richard Lorbieski is here for the first time ever in recorded history. Uh, Paul Thayer is here. Welcome, Paul. John Strong. John T. Robbs is here. Hey, John, how are you? I think this is, might be one of the first or second time you're with us. Bill Noble, as always, looking lovely as ever. Yep. And the lovely and talented L. Curtis Boyle. And the L is for lazy. <laughs> Lackadaisical. Lackadaisical, yes. Uh, Mike was muted. Okay, Richard, you're, you're free to speak whenever, Richard. Uh, nobody else bothers. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Sorry about that. Is it Cavell or Cavill? Or? I would say Cavell. Cavell. Okay, well, welcome from, from the jolly UK. Pleasure to have you Thank again. You. Thank you. And we're going to talk about the color computer. Um, the main topic I thought we would dig into today, we don't have to get to it right away, but uh, there's been a, if there is a hot topic this week, not to mention the store in the mall, but if there's a hot topic uh, regarding the cocoa, that's probably been MAME and, and the discussion of MAME and how to use MAME as a color computer and the, in the, uh, some of the added new benefits and features of MAME, like being able to emulate speech sound pack, being able to emulate John Linville's uh, super game module card that supports sound and all kinds of other stuff. Um, you know, uh, to me, there's, there's a lot going on that make MAME worth looking at, just my opinion. Um, there are plenty of other opinions, and there's plenty of other things we could say, well, MAME doesn't do this, and MAME doesn't do that, and blah, 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 blah. And yes, all these things are true, and these things are all worth talking about. Hey, Rick Adams has joined us. Welcome, Rick. But um, for better or for worse, MAME is a pretty damn good emulator. Uh, and when I say MAME, uh, we are talking about two things now, because now when I say MAME, the mess is silent, right? Because MAME was its own thing for a while, multiple arcade machine emulator, and that's how we played all of our arcade games. And then there was another system known as MESS, multiple emulation super system, and MESS was something that would emulate consoles and home computers. And so MAME and MESS have been merged for quite some time now, so when I say MAME, I'm really talking about... Um, Oh, oh, hold on just a second. Um, I'm getting an echo. Thank you, Mike. I, I, uh, gosh, dang it. Um, all right, let me know if that echo is gone now. I had to reinstall everything today. I've been rebuilding my system. So, yeah, I have to go through all the learning curves and configuration curves to get Skype working, to get my XSplit working. Thank you, Michael Brandt, for telling me there was an echo. I think I just fixed that because XSplit defaults to um, taking a microphone instead of whatever. Yeah. Uh, I am hearing an echo. There you go. Thank you. So hopefully that echo is fixed. But anyway, so MAME and MESS are now oh, the, the same thing. MAME and MESS are the same thing. Oh, okay. And, and um, yeah, okay, I think it's gone. All right, yeah, and, and hello, everybody who's watching. So MAME and MESS are kind of the same thing now. So when you go to MAME and you download MAME, you're downloading MAME and MESS. And when I say downloading, I'm, I mean, I'm assuming you're going to the website, you're downloading what's there. When it comes to building one, there's lots of ways to build it. That's over my head right now. But anyways, MAME, uh, I think MAME is a compelling uh, product to consider. And we'll, and we'll try to demystify it a little bit because for as many cool things as it does, there are lots of other mamey things it does, and it's the mamey things that Mame does that do present, let's just say, some idiosyncrasies, <laughs> so, challenges, <laughs> challenges. So, so that's going to be the main topic we'll talk about. But before we jump into that, does anybody want to go around the room and and just talk about any, anything? Or, you know, take a shower or whatever you're doing there. Um, 
But does anybody want to talk about anything that's been going on this week that is either that they've been doing themselves that may be of interest to us or things you guys have seen posted in the community that might be of interest to talk about? Maybe we'll just go around the room here and just have like an opening topic discussion of anything you guys feel like shouting out before we jump into the main main segment of the show. Um, I, I guess I can talk a little bit about uh, Wayne Campbell is working on his uh, Basic 9 d compiler again, which he actually started decades ago. And actually, I used it back then for testing um, some of the Nitrous 9 stuff. If we had, you know, Basic 9 programs that weren't working properly in Nitrous 9 and the source code wasn't available, we would download it. His old version was called DCOM. And I used it ex on quite a few programs to get, you know, source code back that was missing, including my own stuff. Um, and he's been working on a, a, a more heightened version of it, I guess, and, and fixing some of the bugs that existed back then. So that's been of interest to me. Okay. Well, though apparently, from what he said, not too many people bought the program way back then. So I was probably one of the few. But it's it's a cool Okay. What the hell is that noise? Somebody's got like sounds like a spigot or something going off in the background there. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Huh? All right. Sounds like someone's <laughs> running a buzzsaw or something. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Nick Morentis has just joined us. Good night. Yeah. All right, so sorry about that, Curtis. So uh, you were right. talking about the Wayne Campbell project of DCOM. Yeah. And... I got to do something right back. So this is the uh, feedback and random sound episode, too, of Coco <laughs> Um Actually, why don't Samples we of digital play, sound let's, effects. Let, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's play Name That. Name that interference, and let's see if we can guess <laughs> what it is and where it's coming from. <laughs> that, that one sounded like a semi-truck driving by somewhere. Uh, <laughs> Live from a flatbed on the highway. Right, 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 right. So, 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 t so explain to me more about what this DCOM is. It's, it is a, is it a decompiled or reverse-engineered um, version of the original Basic 09? No, not, not Basic 09 itself, but a Basic 09 programs. Like you have the option of packing them, which makes them run faster, and then you you run them through a runtime package called Run B, um, okay. and and basically it, it makes a tokenized version of it, and also does some other optimizations at the same time, so it runs faster. But once you've got it at that point, you can't list it anymore. It's it's gone from being okay. a source code listing. So if you've downloaded a program that nobody released the source code for, um, or if you've accidentally deleted your own source code, which I've done a few times. Um, it's a way for you to get code back. It won't be identical, but it'll at least be something you can actually edit and list and you know start mucking around with it again and, and changing your source listings. So it's kind of invaluable for me. Like back when we were doing uh, Nitrous 9 development at first, I was decompiling things like the Wild West poker game and I think the Window Writer word processor and stuff because we we're going to expand it to use some of the, the, the better features in Nitrous 9, like faster graphic fonts rather than using hardware text fonts or making sure get put buffers lined up properly so you could optimize the game for in poker's case. So it, it turned out to be quite a useful utility for us for debugging. And it was also just a useful utility for, you know, expanding on somebody else's program that never released a source and he's no longer in the Coca community, so you can't contact them. Right. It's okay. like a disassembler for Basic 9, basically, is what it is. Hmm. For Basic 9 programs, not Basic 9 Okay, so, so once somebody has taken a Basic 9 program and saved it into whatever that the pack format, version. the packed version, this basically depacks it and brings it back into more of a source code format that you can yes. look at it. Okay, I, I got you. I'm slow, but I'm steady. <laughs> It'd be like a Pascal decompiler for P code. Okay, and and so where are we going to be able to get this? Is it available for download just yet? Is there a link to it? Well, wait, wait. Uh, got some versions up of it, but he's got some bugs he's working on right now, so I wouldn't download it right now because okay. there's some known bugs. I got you. Okay. But uh, he's as soon as he gets those fixed, yeah, we'll probably make a link in a, a later show. You know, that once it's you know at the point where it's fairly safe to use. Okay. Michael Brandt threw out a message in the chat that says, Neil and I have a project we would like to gauge interest in for a potential product run. A while ago, a word pack run was done. We want to see if there's any interest in another run. I am not familiar with what word pack is. So That's an 80 column card for the Cocoa 1 and 2. That also works in the Cocoa 3. Okay. Hmm. And there's some programs from OS9 <laughs> Level 1 and even some of the old uh, Cocoa 1 and 2 stuff that support like Dynastar, Dynaspell, Dynacalc, uh, Scred, and a bunch of others actually support. So on a Cocoa 1 or 2, you'd have a real 80 column screen at a faster refresh rate, and it looks even better than the Cocoa 3's 80 column display does. So it's an actual video display? Hard that you plug in. 
Okay, and then you have to plug a monitor into that? Yep. Okay. So it's basically, for lack of a better term, like a Coco VGA card where you plug, or a Coco display adapter, you're plugging into there and you plug a monitor in that and then boom, you're, you're outputting yep. to that. And you could actually, if I remember correctly, under OSI level one, you could actually run both displays at once. Your Coco would have your 32 column display and then you have an 80 column display. It's almost like having. Oh man, that's. A terminal <laughs> building. That's that. That's like a high tech concept on a low tech system. That's actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you could maybe even use that for like debug type stuff too. Possibly yes, while you you're working on something, the, you could say, redirect you're stuff a program to that. On one and redirect your error output to another, and yep. Oh, wow, wow. That, that's and they had a few actually, ACOM things that, that uh, a lot of ACOM cards didn't have back then. Like it, it, the Word Pack Two in particular had like smooth scrolling options and all kinds of stuff too. So interesting, interesting. I, I just want to let you guys know. I apologize, but I have to drop off of this uh, call. So, all I'll right, see you guys again. all right. We'll see you next week, hopefully, Barry. We'll see you next week. Yep. 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 See you, Barry. All right. That, that combined video uh, idea. I used to do that with my uh, first P, uh, my, my first PC, which had a uh, uh, Hercules uh, monochrome card and a uh, CGA graphics card. Neat. And Neat. Uh, you, you could, I could was doing some uh, graphics programming at the time, which was kind of cool. I had my uh, programming editor in the, on the text side and the graphics being uh, generated on the other. Yeah, very cool. And that was John who was just saying that, right? John T. Robbs? Yeah, John T. Yeah. Robbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's far no, because MAME is the, the newer version, well, not MAME, but uh, hello, a lot of things on the brain here, but the latest version of Skype kind of puts a little colored uh, underscore under who's speaking. I just want to make sure I, I grab that. Now that's kind of cool. Yeah, you're really dating yourself. We're we're all dating ourselves when we're talking about the Coco even. But when you, and, <laughs> yeah, Hercules, uh, that's too modern. Yeah, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, Hercules. Yeah, and and I can't I cannot ever now not hear the word Hercules and not think of uh, Eddie Murphy's uh, movie where it's like Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. What was that movie uh, with uh, the Nutty Professor where he's playing his whole yep. family? <laughs> so anytime Her I hear the word Hercules, in, in my mind I always hear Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> the Hercules uh, graphics uh, adapter, MGA, right? Mono graphics adapter. So it, it was something that took, if you only had the green screen monitor that was designed for text, they came up with a way to output graphics, kind of like a, a TRS-80 Model 4 high-res graphics interface. It added graphics to a display that was ultimately designed for pretty much text. Yeah, and it had uh, a pretty uh, weird res too, wasn't it? Like by 348 it, it was, or something? It was non-standard resolution, yeah. It was, pretty it was higher res than a standard 80 column yeah, card. It was actually yeah. really nice text and, and pretty good yeah. graphic. So yeah, you would have to have two graphics cards on a PC to do that. That's kind of, I mean, that's stuff that we do now every day. I mean, it's every PC can output the multiple displays, PC and Mac, so we're kind of used to that, but uh, it was a little bit uncommon in the 80s to have multiple displays off of one system yeah. at one. Especially the early 80s, just when the word pack came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then Tandy actually sold the word pack to, I think, through their express order service later on in the Coco's life. So you who, could actually who, get it from Tandy through uh, express who, order. Who developed it originally? Oh, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember off the top of my head. But it, it was common, like, for people that were running CPM, that they would get an 80-column card sometimes with ah. the CPM. Z80 cartridge, or they'd use the word pack along with. CPM. Okay. So, so now that we've been explained what it is, I guess the question is, what's the interest? I don't know that we're going to get the answer off of this live stream, but yeah, I think that's definitely a good question for the mailing list and probably a good question for the Facebook group. What's the interest? I'm kind of interested um, just to see what it looks like. I'm not sure what the hell I'd be able to plug into it. What was the output on it? Like composite or something else? I think it was composite, yeah. Okay, all right. So um, Michael Brandt saying something like PBJ, uh, peanut butter and jelly. I don't know, is that a company? PBJ. <laughs> yeah, that was a company. That is the right okay, one too. PBJ. I remember as soon as you said that, yeah. I remember. Okay, PBJ. All right, very cool, very cool. So, is there an interest for it? That's a great question. Um, and and even more interesting would be, you know, tying back to our main topic today, MAME. Would MAME be able to emulate that? I would say it probably. It's could. a straight sixty-eight forty-five Motorola video chip. Yeah. I think it was the same one as used in some of the Tiras 80s. So yeah. it's probably already in the emulation. You just have to tie yeah. it in. Yeah. And then a little ROM to help control tie, it. Yeah, tie it into the multi pack or whatever the case may be. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, and so, what else? Uh, before we jump into MAME, anybody got anything you want to talk about real quick? Just what you've been working on this week or what has interested you this week in the world of retro or Coco? I think, uh, Rick, you officially announced that you're working on the. 
Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Just in case I was what? wrong. <laughs> well, you kind of made it public that you're working on Bomb Threat? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's been public for quite some time, yeah. Well, I know it's been public in the Skype group, but I think it was the first time you mentioned it on the list was this past week, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, because uh, I just joined the list a while okay. back, and I was kind of lurking for a while just to kind of get a feel of how things worked on the list before I posted something. So the first time <laughs> I posted something, of course, what am I going to talk about? Well, my project, of course. Sure, sure. So have you figured out how that list works? Because I've been lurking it for quite some time. I still don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> It really seems to be, it, it seems to be, sometimes there's a really interesting topic on there. Sometimes the things people want to talk to about um, ad nauseum are things like, well, who owns the ROMs and how are we going to get these ROMs and, you know, other things that we'll never, ever really have a full control of. But it's, it's oh, a, yeah. It's Anytime a, you, you have a discussion of copyrights, you're going to get a <laughs> lot of heat and not much light. <laughs> there's a lot Pretty of opinion much. on it. Yes, all the all the potential legal Zoom employees are all chiming in now. So, yeah, <laughs> legal Zoom is and not everybody a law has firm. an opinion. Everybody <laughs> has an opinion, and ninety percent of them are wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. That's just how it is. Right, right. But you guys it's, hear it's, all most of people them. discuss They're legally right. what they would like it to be in the yes, law. Yes, like, yes. Most of them have no idea oh, what yeah. the actual law is. And the, the old the old uh, slogan about opinions are every, the opinions are like your derriere. Everyone has one, and they all stink. Or... <laughs> right? Yeah. So no uh, one wants to see yours. I have something <laughs> I could talk about if you guys want. So please, Paul, by all means. Yeah. So you guys probably all know from the Facebook page that I've been working on this Timberman game for like two years. <laughs> First, I was originally doing some stuff in Basic, and obviously that's too slow. So Simon, you know, the great Simon was teaching me how to do assembly language and we got quite far in one year and we're going along developing it and I'm getting things working and it does a page flipping technique, you know, much like your uh, little rocket ship demo there, Steve, that you did this uh, last week mm -hmm. um, to eliminate flicker. And so I was thinking that man, I was blown away by the speed of assembly language. I'm like, oh, man, it's so fast. It goes through everything so fast. I was thinking that I could copy a 6K page and have, like, no, you know, uh, lag. But that didn't work. And so then we started to try and grab backgrounds and re-put them on the screen before you did the draw. And that got complicated real quick. And so then I learned about compiled sprites, I think, from Hugo mm -hmm. before and I got to tell you, compiling sprites is the, probably one of the most boring th activities I've done in my life. <laughs> You're doing by hand? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I managed to get it back up to speed. Um, so I am now able to copy the 6K page over and basically re, re um, erase the background image and then redraw the sprites over it and then flip the page. So that's pretty cool. So I got it up to speed that way. Um, but I took a break from it for a while just because so to to uh, compile these sprites, I would take the image from um, my <clears throat> sprite editor that I made and I would put them into an Excel file with like the, you know, the bit order and everything. And and then I would take that and then type the assembly by hand. And you're oh, talking wow. like, oh, my gosh, lines and lines of assembly. My brother Tim came over. And he's like, dude. How do you have the, this much time to do this? I <laughs> said, I don't even know. But, uh, yeah, so I took a break from that. And then um, as I was contacting you, Stevie, you know, I finished up my PC game, Hotel Elevator Man. So, mm -hmm. which I actually made for my nephew um, this last year. He asked my brother, he, he's obsessed with going to um, hotels or parking lots that have, like, um, elevators in them. Mm -hmm. And push buttons and going up and down because he's autistic. Okay. So, so he asked my brother for uh, elevator buttons for his birthday. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I was like, man, I think we could probably make that happen. You know, like uh, order some buttons, put them together, make it kind of, I don't know, run a motor that vibrates to make it sound like you're going up there. Well, it's like $150 for a light panel for an elevator by itself. Wow. So then I got to thinking, well, the kid really likes Super Mario Brothers, right? So he loves platforming games. So I'm going to put hotel elevator buttons and platforming games together. 
And that's how Hotel Elevator Man came to be. And it was originally going to be a Color Computer 3 game. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had to November to complete it. And my assembly uh, language skills were just not up to speed to be able to complete okay, it. Okay, you had to reach a deadline of the actual birthday. So Yep, so yeah, I started yeah, yeah. Game Maker on PC. So Yeah. Yeah, I tried a I tried a version of it that you sent me. It's pretty damn good, and I definitely now that you and I are in a little bit better contact, I certainly want to schedule a time where we can really showcase you know this this product and other projects you're working on, you know, and really look at some of these things because it's it's interesting. Anything we can do that is for the Coco or resembles the Coco is you know Coco inspired is definitely worth kind of celebrating and talking about, you know. So. Yeah, well, I sent it out to. I've had a lot of different players play it, and they really like um, the graphical, you know, um, the way it looks graphically. And I said, well, it's based on a sixteen color color computer from back in nineteen eighty six. So right, it can. Yeah, can well, can, the, really can the program play. run full screen? I don't remember because I can I can pull up the version that I have right now on my PC. Like if I launch it, will it run full screen or is it a window? It's in a window. Uh, can I can I make that window any bigger? Uh, I don't know. I've never tried. <laughs> All right, let me see. Let me see if I can get it up right now. And um, oh, I gave you the install. Well, okay. Uh, I should have given you zip folder. Well, this but is an old. Was... This is an older one. This is one you sent me a while ago. I think you just sent me a new one. I'm not sure or something. I, I just did, yeah because I changed the fonts to be more pixelated because like everything's really pixely and kind of retro looking, and the fonts were really smooth like newer games and i was like well that uh, kind of doesn't really fit the the mold so i went uh, back and i changed a lot of stuff and i added a trophy for completing the unlockable level the basement man uh, that thing cool. takes, yeah, yeah that thing takes all the do- to unpack there and grant leedy has just joined us welcome grant how you feeling so i mean we don't have to stay on it the topic of that i just wanted yeah, to talk well about. i mean well what, nobody can see what i'm doing right now but you guys but yeah i'll try to get it up and running and once i get it up and running i will then try to pull it up on the screen because yeah it's definitely very cool it's very retro like you say retro platform inspired and um it's definitely coco centric and it looks like it could be on a coco and everything else and and um it's something that's a little bit of interest to me as well because whenever I finally get into the point where I start developing quote unquote real games, I'm definitely going to want to know tools I can do to make them run on other platforms too, so there's a broader right. audience or exposure for the program. You know, so if you can take you can take a game idea, and do it on the Coco, and then make it run on Windows. You know, even better. You know, if you can make it where it can run on mobile, you know, or on web based things like that, that's cool too. So that's something that. It's way ahead of where, where I am, but it's something I'm ultimately going to want to do. Yeah, and Game Maker actually will give you that capability. So I discovered it like 15 years ago. It was originally written by a guy in Denmark named Mark Overmars. And it used to be like $18 to get a full version of this thing. Mm-hmm. Well, Yo-Yo Games bought him out like I don't remember how long ago that was. But now they've exploited the crap out of it, of course. you know. Um, mm-hmm. But you can make... Uh, games and things for mobile phones and Mac and everything else with this, and but it's one hundred and fifty dollars now as opposed to eighteen bucks. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty cool tool, and it's something that I've wanted to incorporate on the Coco for a really long time. So you can like design sprites and get sounds and things like that, and then you basically combine all these resources, and then it has a built-in programming language that you can design games and other things with and i'd like to adapt that to the coco but i'm not sure if it's something that it can really be a reality um just because of like memory limitations and things like that so mm. who knows hey paul yeah oh this is john strong and, Hi, john. Uh, uh, first of all i want to offer you help anytime you need some help on games okay oh thank you uh secondly um Originally, Game Maker, you could uh, grab the resources to uh, use in other things. I don't know what the current status is, because I've also looked at Game Maker. And uh, my tools will do a, a, a little bit of what Game Maker will do. Could have saved you, if you was a Cocoa 3 for compiled sprites, I could have saved you a huge amount of time. Oh, really? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, um but doing it yourself, it's a good way to learn about it, okay? 
Yeah. So, you, know, you, you know what you're doing now with it. And, uh, go on to the elevator and press the space bar, Steve. Sorry to interrupt you, John. There you go. Oh, no, that's just <laughs> <So>. fine. <laughs> that's and cute. So, uh, uh, game Maker has been out here. Uh, I do know a lot originally written in uh, Delphi, which is an object Pascal, uh, you know, grandson of Turbo Pascal, something like that, if you want to call it that. Um, so I'm actually familiar with the tool set, because I use the C++ version of it for my tools. Oh, okay. And so, and I do believe you're in, here in Michigan, too. <laughs> Shoot. And so, uh, you know, if it comes to a point that we'd actually need a you know, person-person meetup to help you, and it might be possible. Are you a Michigander, John? Where do you live? Oh, I, I, I live over in Charlotte. Okay. Yeah, I'm in Grand Rapids myself. Yeah, so. actually, I, I thought told my wife about it. We was over in Grand Rapids yesterday. We start to Costco. our... Uh, screwed up. Yeah, it's cute. It's really cute. Yeah. And so, yeah, Game Maker has a lot of, a lot of things. It has some limitations. I've looked at it... Thought about making things with it, and I get distracted from it. <laughs> but yeah. uh, it, it's a good tool to uh, to right. learn game, uh, a logic to you know to put something together. And um, it's definitely cute. Yes. Well, that's very cool of you to offer, John. Because yeah, you've definitely um, you know you've got a lot of cool tools, and you've offered to share your tools and techniques and time and talent with everybody so that's very cool yeah we should well, work together john thank you yeah it's been something I, I was kind of intending and like you're on like okay i can i can do this before i forget it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know I, I sometimes you have that uh slept since then syndrome <laughs> right <laughs> but uh yeah I, i'm enjoying seeing what you're doing paul and continue to do so yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I mean, uh, I like any project that's being developed for the Cocoa. I don't care if it's a big, elaborate project, if it's a smaller project, if it's in basic, if it's in assembly, if it's hardware. Um, if somebody's making something for the Cocoa, I'm excited about it. And, um, you know, but there's there's a lot of things wrong with me, too, probably. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's, and it's great that there's a great... Um, kind of support structure here where everybody's willing to help out other people. And like you mentioned, Simon Jonason, um, you know, he's helped out a million people. And he also talks about how Sockmaster helped him when he was learning assembly and taught him how to optimize and think outside of the box. And so it's kind of cool when people pay it forward and, um, you know, they learn something and then they share something. And I think at the end of the day, it helps the entire community at large by us having the ability to create more content for us to all enjoy you know and speaking of creating content uh, ed snyder has joined the text chat and ed snyder's a guy we really need to get on skype one of these days number one just to hear his voice instead of just reading what he says i almost feel like ed is uh, some type of phantom hacker that lives inside a computer because i've never actually spoken to him <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he's like the ghost in a shell or something but yeah it'd be great to get ed on here just to verbalize stuff and answer questions but we really i would love to get ed one day where we can sit down and talk about his vast array of projects and things he has created and things he continues to work on that would be a great kind of you know show to have where we just talk about all things ed snyder and coco hardware you know uh, so we really need to coax ed into doing that with us one day yeah and indeed does he ever sleep <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do a lot of cases for him, and so you know, I, I email him and and stuff, but ne never ever talk to him, yeah, you know, yeah. verbally, you know. So, yes, yeah, Ed, would like to. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we jump in? Uh, unless anybody else had anything they wanted to throw out there, real quick. Why don't we jump in and 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 go through a dry run of setting up Mame to be a Coco, because that's kind of the meat and potatoes. What we're going to talk about today. Uh, we'll talk about everything that's cool about it and everything that's kind of maybe not so cool about it so where the hell did my um am i still live streaming i am yep. hold on I yeah i need to move stuff around all right so i need to go back to a full screen situation here and um all right so we're on a full screen you know what i am such an idiot i had everything oh it's over here maybe 
to say I had everything in a browser window. I, I'm, I swear to God, I'm having a hard time managing two uh, screens right now. Okay, there's my live stream. Here's the Facebook page. All right, here's MAME. All right, so let's talk about how do we get MAME going. And, and, and for the sake of simplicity and the sake of consistency, what I'm going to show you right now is what anybody else can do. I, I, there are there are many shades of MAME, you know, so you can talk about different forks, you can talk about um, some of the pre-release stuff that's being circulated right now where people are compiling uh, the new versions and circulating those, and I actually want to be able to host those, but we're already halfway through June. By the end of June, the latest release, so you see right now the current release is 0186 Bravo. Um, or beta, however you want to look at that. So B for Bravo, I think it's the military way to say it. So uh, 186 is 186 B is the current version you can download right now off the internet. And at the end of June, I believe the date was somewhere around June 28th, is when 187 is released. And I just think that's kind of funny because 187 is the police code for homicide. So, um, but um, 187 is going to be the build of MAME that officially supports the speech sound cartridge, um, as well as John Linville's, um, what is John's thing called? Super Game Cartridge or Super Game Module or something like that. It's the new ROM pack that will include the sound chip that is what John Linville is working on. Um, and so that is also going to be able to be emulated including the ROM that shows off the demo he brought to CocoFest. So his CocoFest ROM cartridge was playing a bunch of music on this new um, synthesizer chip. So that can also be emulated. And the moral of that story is, if anybody was concerned about, well, how can I um, develop a program for new sound hardware if I don't have access to the hardware? Well, technically, you don't need it when you can emulate it. So it's a way to kind of try before you buy, get the program working. And um, Game Master, so Tim Lindner just, just chimed in. He says it's the Game Master Cart, and it was re it's released the last Wednesday of each month. Okay, so there you have it. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to download, uh, because my computer is 64 bits, I'm going to download the 64-bit version. Now I'll give you a quick little technical tip. How do you know if your computer runs 64 bits? Well, I can't tell you on a Mac because I don't have a Mac right now. But if you if you're and, and I'm so old school, I call I still call this my computer. I used to call it my computer, my documents, my network neighborhood, because I've been using Windows since like Windows, you know, since DOS. So what now might say computer or PC, I still call my computer. If you do a right mouse click on my computer and you hit properties, you're going to see a pop up that's going to tell you um, how much memory you have. And if your operating system is 64 bits, it will say right here it's a 64 bit operating system. If it doesn't say 64 bits, then it's not because I don't know if some of the older versions of like Windows XP and Windows Vista and Windows 7, I don't think they actually specified that they were 32 bits, but they would always specify if they were 64 bits. So if you're not sure, there's where you can check. So I'm going to download MAME, and this is the Windows binaries. Um, so this is MAME 64 EXE. I'm going to download this, and I'm just going to save this to my desktop. And Steve, a, another yeah. easy way to tell is if, if your operating system recognizes more than uh, 4 gigs of memory. If you have more, yeah, if you have more than 4 gigs of RAM, too, because 32 bits only goes up to 4 gigs. Good, good point there, yeah. All right, so now, oh, this one is not... Um, this one is not, okay, so this will self-extract. So is it going to go to users, desktop? Will it create the MAME folder or is it going to throw it all in my desktop? Let me just type in the word MAME just in case because I'm not sure what the hell is going to happen here. All right. So, yeah, all right. So I'm extracting MAME to my desktop, and I should have here in just a minute, I should have MAME installed. Um, and right now, MAME by itself is not very useful okay so here's my main folder i don't know if i'm going to have mame inside of mame no i don't all right so here's my main folder and in my main folder here this is where i would launch mame 64 and right now if i just launch mame 64 and oh and it just showed up on a on a whole different um window uh, i need to see if i can drag it over here all right so this is mame 64 i don't know what the hell i just launched here all right, no driver loaded. I've got nothing loaded in, in MAME right now. Now, the thing about MAME is that 
Uh, MAME, the, the way it's licensed is you're not allowed to distribute ROMs with MAME. It's against the open source agreement. And so MAME is like, listen, our job is to emulate the hardware. There's a lot of gray areas. Some of them are moral. Some of them are legal as far as can I distribute a ROM, um, things like that. So technically, anything that's on a ROM file is copyright and belongs to someone or something your ability to use it will vary your mileage may vary I, I believe the general statement is that if you own the original hardware technically you're allowed to have a backup of the ROMs that are in there but this this is not a legal show folks so um, let's just say that you know if you didn't buy it and you don't own it then technically it's kind of uh, you know you're kind of like breaking a law or stealing or copyright infringement or something uh, on on old stuff, right? So anyways, uh, we have MAME open. What you need to be able to do with MAME is in the ROMs folder is where you need to stick the ROMs. Now, if this if we were gonna run MAME to be an arcade system, this is where we would put Donkey Kong and Pac-Man and all the ROM files to play those games. But we're not gonna play games. We're gonna use MAME as mess. So we have to get the ROMs. And by the way, the links to all of these is in the description to this video. And once again, the ROMs that I'm going to show you here, these are available to download, but just realize there are certain moral and legal considerations to do when doing this. So I'm not here to give legal advice, um, but let's just, you know, to be honest, there's a lot of crap people get off the internet, right? So um, this is being hosted on the Color Computer Archive. These are the various ROMs for the various color computers that you will need to stick into our ROMs folder. So as I go to download each of these, what I'm going to do just to make my life a little bit easier is I'm going to go to my desktop. I'm going to go into that MAME folder, and I'm going to go into my ROMs folder, and I'm going to download them and save them here. So I have Coco Zip. Coco Zip will emulate a, a stock Coco 1. Then there's Coco 2, and that emulates, I think, a 64K color computer 2. There is Coco 2 Bravo, and this one emulates the Coco 2 with the upgraded VDG that has better looking fonts and supports lowercase. There's Coco 3. Coco 3, of all things, emulates a Coco 3. Probably the DW1 is DriveWire, right? I would imagine. Um, We'll download it for cramps and giggles. We'll just stick it in here. Now there's Coco 3H. This is the one that emulates the Hitachi 6309 processor. I have no idea what Coco 3P does. Um, PAL. PAL. Okay, PAL. Then there's a Coco E. So is that a Coco 1E or something? I don't know. Coco Enhanced? Who the hell knows? Um, Coco with a Direct Connect modem. No freaking idea there. So I guess that emulates the modem hardware. Um, Coco Orchestra 90. This is the emulating of the Orchestra 90 stereo output card. This is the speech sound pack that was just emulated. We just talked about this last week from Tim Lindner. Right, so we're, we're downloading speech sound pack. What is a CP400? Was that a computer? Yes. That was a South American Brazilian, I think, or something. A Coco oh, clone? okay. So that's the Coco clone. Okay. So we'll down with a floppy drive controller. We'll download these for craps and giggles. And then we have a Dragon 32 and a Dragon 64. So I'm downloading more cocoa crap than I need. But I'm basically downloading all these different ROMs here, and they're being stored in the ROMs folder under MAME. So now MAME should be able to emulate a cocoa. Now I'm hoping that MAME will, um, will run. Now I'm having a slight issue here where MAME is showing up as a full screen. So here's what I'm going to do real quick. I'm going to do one of Tim Lindner's tricks that I learned last week, and this is um, uh, a way to do a command line. So I need to go into my desktop. Uh, I don't know what the hell my desktop folder is. It's Steve. All right, so here's the MAME folder I'm doing in a command prompt, and I believe it's MAME64.exe-cc. And what that's going to do is that's going to generate the MAME any file. And so I've just used a command line utility to generate a MAME any file. And somewhere in here, I want to tell this bloody thing to um, not go full screen so I can move it around. Um, I just have to find it. Here's where you set all your paths to everything. Um, auto save. I don't know where all these settings are. And this is, again, we can, we can already start to say, dude, this is a huge pain in the ass. It's so much easier to run VCC, which I would agree with you. But part of the setting up to this thing here is... Um, is uh, you know just getting it tweaked and then um, not having to do with it again. Somewhere in here is the freaking option 
to not run full screen. And I don't know where the hell that option is. Miscellaneous options, video options, video is auto, window is zero. Let's change a window to one. All right. So this will... For you're and talking? I would recommend the maximize to zero. Okay, so that was towards the end. Window to one, maximize to zero. Yeah, because I can't stand the window being just like you had it full screen. So <laughs> Right. Okay, so window one, that's meaning true or on. We're saying yes, run in a window, and no, don't maximize. Okay, so now we've saved those two settings. And again, these are some one-time tweaks. Now I should be able to double-click MAME64. Okay, and then here it is. Now MAME shows up. Damn it, it's showing up on my other screen. I don't want you on my other screen, D-bag. Now, what is MAME designed to do? MAME is designed to emulate pretty much every system on the planet. And so it's now trying to run every game for every system. So what am I going to do right now to make this more Coco friendly? I'm going to type in the word color computer. Now, do you see where it says color computer here? I am now going to click on uh, the little star here, and I'm going to add that to my favorites. Um, then I'm going to do the same thing for all these sub flavors here. So Color Computer 2, Color Computer 2B, Color Computer 3 NTSC, Color Computer 3 NTSC with the Hitachi. Uh, what is HPD DOS? That's one of the ones. Um, That's the DriveWire one. Okay. And then if I wanted to, I could also then type in Dragon. Um, Dragon 32, maybe. Yeah, so now I could take Dragon 32. I could star that. I can then go back and type in Dragon 64. And then I could star that. Dragon 64, I'll star. Dragon 64, star. Okay, now I've basically favorited everything. If I click on favorites, now I've got a short list. And so now instead of looking at every system and game in the universe that MAME can emulate, I can go to favorites. Now I've got my short little list here. Now, before you launch any of these machines here too, this is where you could also set some, com some configuration options before you launch it. Like under Color Computer, if I go to Configure Machine, this is where I could do some one-time setups here, like device mapping. Is this where you told me to go, um, David, yes. to turn off the mouse? So if you go to Device Mapping and Device Mouse Assignment, if you turn that off and I go to Previous Menu, I have now... Save the machine. Save the machine. Save machine configuration. Configuration saved. And will that do it for all the machines? Nope. It should. Yeah, it's machine machine basis. All right. So let's return to previous menu. So we'll go here. We'll go to configure machine. The mach and so uh, if I go to configure machine, double click, device mapping. No, it's it's there because they're child because they're children of the Coco parent. I oh, think okay. That, they think they automatically get that now. What else do I want to mess with here? Um, before I, there's another wacky thing about MAME, right? There is this user in stream went offline. Uh, you seem to be fine. Well, I just restreamed it. All right, guys. I don't know, guys. I don't know what happened. Um, my live stream went offline. I don't remember where we left off <laughs> on this. So I'll probably record a separate how-to video. I mean, we're doing a lot of stuff live right now. And so um, we have the color computer up. Um, I just I just saw somebody say on the screen, um, you know, are you guys not there? Um, because I can't see the chat, let me do something real quick. I want to copy the chat to the screen here. So I'm switching screens here for just a second. I want to copy this. And then now when I go back to my full screen, I'm going to paste this. All right. Okay, so now I can kind of watch the chat while things are going on. Yeah, all right, so I don't remember where the hell we just left off, so let me just close this and let me start over. All right, um, and there's just weird stuff going on with, with MAME. And, and to be honest, the way I've been running MAME that I learned from Tim is I've been running MAME from a command line, and so MAME automatically launches the way I want it to. I don't have to deal with these a lot of these gooey things here. So. Let's just try this again for the benefit of anybody who's missed this. So if you missed the part where I said you have to download all the ROMs, all your Cocoa ROMs need to be in the ROMs folder. And I downloaded those from the Color Computer Archive. The next thing I did when I went to MAME and I launched MAME, so MAME kind of comes up here 
in its um, own little window here and I'll, I'll go ahead and maximize it over here. So what I did is I took all the color computers and I favorited them. So I went to where it says all. I did a search up here for like color computer. And then from here, I was I just went to each of these and I clicked on it and I hit the star and that adds them to the favorite. I don't know if that got in the stream. Once I go to my list of favorites, it's easier to see just the color computer list, right? So another thing we did is once I highlighted color computer, I went to configure machine, double click that, I went to device mapping, and we actually turned off the mouse mapping. So the, so the color computer emulation does not map the mouse. You then have to do save machine configuration. And then the good point about this is that now when I run my Coco, um, it will automatically run. Now, what was it? Control F? Is that what Tim was saying? That you can launch the machine right away? I don't know. I'm not sure what can co uh, control F is now showing me the, the main mouse. I don't know what's going on here. Anyways, if I run a color computer two now, and now I have to hit start empty. And once again, I don't know why my computer's making this pop up on the other screen. I gotta keep moving over. This is an option here. What is the what is this option here? We need to turn this off in the any file where it displays uh, game information. Something like that. We'll turn that crap off. All right, so here's MAME. Now what if I want to load a file into MAME? This is another challenge with MAME, right? So right now the user interface is not um, enabled in a way where I can even get to my file menu. So you have to press, what is it? Um, scroll lock? Scroll lock, right? So once I press scroll lock, I get a message here that says we're in partial emulation. Now I can hit tab. And now from tab, this is where you can change a few more things. And actually what I want to do here too, is I want to change what the pause key is. And so right now if I press P on the, P go, P on the keyboard, that actually pauses the screen. Once you go into partial emulation, or partial keyboard emulation, which is by the way what you need in order to load up files and stuff, you kind of lose um, skip game info. Okay, Tim says it's uh, skip game info. So yeah, I want to get rid of that skip game info. So what I did here is I press scroll lock. I'm going to go into, is it input general? Under user interface, there is something I want to find here. Okay, so the pause key. I don't want the pause key to be the P key. So I'm going to click on pause. I'm going to hit delete to delete the configuration. I'm going to click on pause again. And then I actually press the pause key on. <laughs> no, my, my name is not Nick Marentis. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You'll grow into it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're back. And um, so another one of the challenges of MAME, and this is not MAME's fault, although there's plenty of things we can fault MAME for, but um, certain keys I'm pressing on my freaking keyboard to deal with the myriad of MAME keys that must be configured are causing my freaking stream software to stop streaming. So I just had to turn off all the hot keys in my streaming software so I quit stopping the streams. I don't remember when the stream stopped. Thank you somebody for watching that and let me know. Right as soon as you hit P apparently. So one thing I did is I changed the pause key from the P key to the actual pause button on my keyboard. So now if I want to pause the game on my PC keyboard, there's a pause key. Another key I want to change here is one that's called UI cancel. And I don't want to accidentally escape too many times. So when I double click UI cancel, I'm going to change this to numpad minus because that is, um, that's actually what um, Eric Gavrilik recommended that he uses. Uh, he was chatting with me on Facebook and said, yeah. All right. So what do I have right now? I've got MAME that works. And MAME's in a window and I can move MAME around and I can actually move my mouse inside and outside of MAME. So it's, as Nick calls it, I can now multitask. <laughs> so um, now I have got MAME emulation. How would you load a disk in MAME? Well, if you are in the, um, we need to get out of this menu now, right? So let's hit, what is it, previous menu? Lord have or mercy. Escape. Or now it's not that. No, because what happens is, okay, here we go. Return to previous menu, on, and then so return to machine. So let's try it again. I want to take it from the top, this time with feeling. Um, if I'm here and I press tab, this is the main pop-up, and this is where I would go to File Menu. Then I would go to my floppy, 
and then this is where I would browse to where I want to load a floppy disk so again it's there's work involved here right so to browse through your GUI and do all of these things here so if I um, crap I don't even remember where I have half of my crap stored so anyway so yeah somewhere on my C drive under users I have stuff in my Google Drive right so if I go to users I go to Steve I go to Google Drive and then I go to my MAME here and then somewhere in here is a, is a program called Steve Disk right isn't there? I don't know. I'm hallucinating. You can type. You can type the first few letters, and it should f find it if it is there. Steve Disk. Okay, and then I can say read write. All right. Now I've loaded the disk. Now this disk is in here, and I type in dir, and I can see. Oh, and this has got the noise too. This has actually got the floppy noise. So now here's my program, right? And so like one of my most recent programs that I that I demoed was Fonts Three. And um, this is going to load up my fonts. But yeah, so can you launch the Coco in a MAME? Yes. Can you get MAME to then load in your files? Absolutely. Um, is it elegant? Absolutely not, right? Okay, who's chatting right now? So we have Michael Brandt. Once again, not a good day for streaming. Okay, we're back up. Hello, everyone. Bosco is here. Okay, hello, Bosco. Sixy here. Um, there we go. So a few people are chatting. All right, so this is and then now how do I get out of this the Coco emulation you can press the end key to get out but because I also turned off escape as my um, exit UI command I can also press escape oh no I didn't son of a biscuit it made a liar out of me <laughs> ah crap did that not get saved no I think you forgot to delete the line before setting ah, the okay so yeah so so herein lies the challenge right is that MAME has lots of video sequences to it so now that I've kind of showed you what um, what you know what you got to do to get it going and and we lost the stream 500 times so I don't know where the hell that begins and ends but um, here's how I'm running MAME for myself right now I've actually got MAME in my Google Drive folder so I can pull it up from anywhere so when I go to my MAME folder um, I've created a, a launcher file that I kind of um, borrowed from Tim and so I got to find, okay, so I've got this file here that launches the Coco. And so if I was to make my font a little bigger here, just so you guys can read it. Um, yeah, format, let's turn on word wrap too. So basically I'm launching MAME or MESS. I'm launching Coco 2, which is the ROM file I want to launch. I'm turning on an external multi-pack. I'm putting the speech sound pack in slot three. I'm doing a skip game info. I'm making it run in a window. I'm making the user interface active, which is the partial emulation. Um, and then I am also mounting floppy disk one to my disk. So it's steve.dsk. So this is a little launcher file that I run now. I don't run MAME through the GUI anymore. I run it this way. So when I run my Coco launch bat, what I get, and of course mine is not, um, Mine, I can't multitask in this one. I wasn't able to figure that one out in mess. And maybe it's because this is a hybrid compilation. I don't know. It's not the full library. But in this one here, this launches my program, launches it in a window. And when I type in dir, my floppy disk is here. All right. And so I have been able to make MAME work for me. And so you can already see here, is, it, is there a lot of work involved to set this thing up? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It is not... It is not an out-of-the-box configuration at all. But I think anybody who's familiar with MAME, so if you've never run an emulator before and you're learning this for the first time, this might not be the first pill you want to swallow. But if you've used MAME to play arcade games, and I believe a lot of people had, this isn't a far stretch from going from launching Pac-Man to launching a Coco. But because now we're running a computer, there's a lot more things you got to do. You got to be able to open up files and you have to deal with the funky keys and the overlay menus and the user interface. And so, yeah, there's a lot of things about MAME that we could sit here and, and just tear apart and, and chastise and everything else. And it is such a complex, complex animal and it does so many things. It's really hard for this to be the perfect Coco emulator. But when it comes to actually doing the emulation, it's probably one of the better ones. And when it comes to being able now to support the multi-pack interface with the speech sound cartridge and John Linville's sound card, it is literally the only one who can do that right now. So 
I think anybody who's going to be developing software can probably handle getting MAME off the ground. If you're a casual user, this might not be the emulator you start with. But if you're a developer, I think you can handle this. Um, will you use this to develop new software? That then becomes the question. Are we going to start developing new things to take advantage of the speech sound cartridge? Will we try to develop things to run on a cartridge and test those waters and maybe develop something on a cartridge? Will we try to develop things to take advantage of new sound? The, the, the technology is here now for us to try it. Um, I know this took probably longer than it needed to take and it sounded a lot more confusing than it did and the fact I kept losing my stream didn't make things any easier. I will try to record a step-by-step -step video and simplify, <laughs> simplify <laughs> this process as much as possible. But at the end of the day, yeah, we can sit here and come up with a million reasons why <laughs> why there's things to, to bitch about with this program. I'm not going to defend that because you just saw me struggle. So, um, But I will say that I like it. And I plan to keep using it. So that's yeah, why. Once you get sense. it up and running, it's good. But it, it's it's with great power comes great responsibility. There's a lot of setup. Because yes. yeah. there's so many options. Yeah. Um, the other nice thing about the sound cart uh, support and sound siege back support now is because MAME also has a built-in debugger where you can do like memory traces, live running of code, set breakpoints and watch points and everything else is that it's great as a developer tool. No, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, the debugging capability. Right. And so, yeah, so... Somebody just mentioned just as soon as I get an actual SSC. Well, yeah, yeah, you. But see, that's the thing. Speech sound cartridges are very difficult to come across, uh, Sixty. So, yeah, you could look for one, but re the reality is, is you kind of don't need to because you can emulate the speech sound cartridge and you can develop for it and not have the real thing. Um, now, one of the things that we did discover, even in our first demonstration of the speech sound pack, is there is. There was, uh, there's a, l there are some slight differences because it's being emulated, and you guys can probably speak better to this than I could because I don't understand how hardware and assembly works. But S Speech Sound Pack is coming through the DAC, and so is um, the joystick controller. And so certain times you have to change your polling between sound and between input, and and that is something that I guess you don't notice in real hardware, but there was a slight hiccuping sound like on when the music loops on Pitfall 2, you can hear a small chirping sound when it loops. Now, Tim Lindner says that's something he was aware of, and I think that's something that will probably get better with time, which is why there's already a second version of the 187 out already. Um, so is it going to be as perfect as the real hardware? Maybe not 100%, but we'll let you test and do a proof of concept that you can develop for it. I would say absolutely, right? My, my naive brain, right? All right, so Nick Morentis, you ready to get out the fire hose and, and, and squirt all over this? <laughs> VCC. <laughs> I, got three, I got three letters I for you. Inside. <laughs> I was wondering how long it was going to take for that one. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Gr Grant, are you with us? I see his face. Grant, do you read me? He's, he's, he's been in the chat. Me. I'm not watching. He might be now. muted. Or maybe he's in a noisy environment and can't share his mic at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah, is MAME for the faint of heart? Maybe not. But should MAME be considered by developers? I think you should. I think we should all give it a shot. Um, yeah. now, now that you're here, why don't you go to the Mess UI page and put that on and, and, and redo the whole thing with Mess UI? Okay. Do a search for Mess UI. Download the single file, copy it, copy it into MAME, and run that, and do what you were doing just now. Well, I kind of, well, I'll, I'll save us the download struggle because I have it somewhere. Um, yes, Steve, I'm here. I had my uh, mic muted accidentally. Okay, how are you? Doing good, thank you. All right. Well, how how are you recovering? Well. Yes, I am almost 100 percent. Very good, very good. All right, so we'll try this again now. I'm going to try switching over to full screen. All right, so here's Mess UI, Nick. 
I have mess UI on the screen. So mess UI, and there's probably a MAME UI as well. And this is kind of a front end loader that should make things a little bit easier to launch. So here's Color Computer 2 on, on mess. Should I go ahead and run this? Uh, just let people see some of the options that you were changing before, I guess. All right, well, I'm not as familiar with this one because I don't use it. Uh, just right click on Coco 2. Okay. And do um, like properties. Yeah, uh, properties for Coco 1 and 2, the next one down. Yeah, the properties very bottom one. What does that bring up? Uh, well, we yeah, have so things like run in a window. The, run yep. in a window, start out, maximize. Uh, you, you do want to run in a window, don't you? Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah. We don't want to be maximized, right? Yeah. Okay. How do you get the uh, menu to pop up? Okay. Uh, Controller mapping. This is where we would turn off mouse. Yeah, the, is that the one you got to turn off? Yeah. Yeah, mouse device turn off. Yep. All right. Um, what else is there? Yeah, you, you can tell it what screen to work on. Um, there is a way, triple buffering, V-Sync, refresh. Yeah, no, it's all uh, MAME stuff. Oh, there is another feature that, that is nice. Oh, we'll, we'll oh go look back. at this. And this already has now, this has the menu across the top. Yeah. Here. So I've got file. Click on media. Media, this is where I There's can load on a floppy, floppy disk. disk. Okay. And mount a file. Mm hmm And then you would browse. Wherever, wherever right. your and now, files And are. now we're using the Windows GUI instead of the MAME GUI. And is this better? Hell yeah, it's yep. better. Right? <laughs> so now I can go into Google Drive. I can go to my MAME. I could look for like my Steve disk. All now, right. has MessUI been ported to Mac or Linux yet? Not yet. Okay. Okay. So right now, this is a Windows only solution. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the one thing that I think I'm seeing here is that depending on how I, how, yeah, the um, the screen scaling is not perfect of the fonts, but that's minor, right? That's probably an option somewhere too for the screen for the uh, aspect ratios. But I notice when I have kind of a, an, a wonky resolution that my fonts look a little distorted. Yeah, that's now that that's I'm full. Normal. Now that I'm full size, it's fine. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, mess UI you, is definitely <laughs> a little bit more uh, user friendly. Close that. Go back to the main menu again. Uh huh. And right click on Coco two. Yeah. Uh, properties again. The, the very bottom. Well, that's. Yeah, for the Coco 2. Go to screen. Uh-huh. Uh, is it Aspect screen? Ratio. Or, is, or maybe it's advanced. I can't remember now. That one. Yeah, down the bottom, select effect. Oh, this is where you can do things like the... Uh, just pick the scan lines one. That right, one. Right. And, open, and mm -hmm. I apply OK. And now run Coco 2. Yeah. And enlarge that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there now we, it looks like it has scan lines on it. It's sort of, anyway. There's a few other effects you yeah, can Yeah, yeah, there's, there's some RGB ones. There's a few others, yeah. right? So, yeah, no, that's, that's that. I, I remember doing that just on arcade emulation, too. So, yeah, some of those effects of the of the UI. So, if you're running MAME or you're running MESS, there's, there has historically been a MAME UI or a MESS UI that you could tap into on top of that. And... Does it make it uh, easier? It does. So what is the, if there is a downside to this, if anything, I guess, or uh, 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 should we issue a disclaimer? Because the UI is not always developed on the same release cycle, or maybe it is, I don't know, but you have, to keep, them in, you have to keep them in sync, right? You have to make sure you've got the version of the UI that matches the actual release of MAME or MESS that you're running, right? So... Um, yeah, but yeah, having this little menu here with media and insert a cartridge cart, right? So cassette printout. So the, I am not sure how you would actually tell it to um, run a multi-pack, though, from here. That's probably a minor deal, though, right? So edit paste. Would that be in the options for the Coco 2 that you saw in the main menu? Mm, possibly. Well, I, just... I, I think the normal DOS UI is still there if you do a... Um scroll lock you do go back to that menu as well uh, 
All right, let's try this. And again, is this going to be literal to where, okay, so if I go to edit and I go to paste, look at this. I'm actually painting in, pasting in um, from a text file. <laughs> so that's something too that you can do in MAME, um, but you got to go into your menu and then you have to do a paste UI, right? So there is a way to do this in MAME. So if there's a moral to this story, is, is MAME UI or MESS UI a nice way to kind of cheat uh, the emulator and make it easier for us human beings? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I'm not going to diss this at all. Um, pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. So, um, yeah, MESS UI is pretty good. So, not bad. I think the only thing that you have to be aware of is that um, MESS UI will not necessarily always be on the same release schedule and on the same versions as the official version of it, so you just have to make sure it matches that. The version that uh, we're... Think, go ahead. I think uh, a lot of the uh, mess UIs will still work anyway. It's just that if they've added new features in in MAME, oh, mess UI right. may not support it. So hence, if you keep up with the uh, mess UI, mm. it should support it. Right, because oh, at I've the end of the day, it's, it's just a front-end loader for MAME anyway. It's just right? a single file. Yeah, it just yeah. copied it in that directory. Away you go. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely... And the fact that you have a menu bar on top of your emulator already yep. makes it look a little bit more like XROAR or VCC, right? Yeah. Um, so, no, nah, bravo. This is good. And the fact I can, again, I can move my mouse inside and outside of the emulator, which I hadn't figured out how to do before. Um, nice feature. So, MAME. Yes, I've already got a headache from this. And so, I like <laughs> MAME. I like MAME. I would like to say that I would like to be a champion for MAME. But um, I also live in the world that I see MAME and I use MAME. And I'm, I can't lie about <laughs> the things about MAME that aren't necessarily that It's often. ease of use needs help. Yes. So... <laughs> It and, and really, that, that's its main problem. MAME is the better emulator. It's just yeah. its ease of use it, it is, is atrocious. Yeah, yeah. So, it was written by developers for developers, basically, is the UI that's built in. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. even then, it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> and, and that UI is a somewhat newer feature because it didn't exist in like up to like the 015s or whatever it was. I forgot when the, when the UI became a thing. Um, but there was a time when MAME was a command line prompt thing and you almost had to use the MAME UIs back then to launch MAME because nobody wanted to l run every game from a command line. Um, cool stuff, cool stuff. Let's let's move over to um, something that's not about MAME. Um, and we will talk about, since we have Nick Morentis here, maybe we can talk about the latest blog post of Gunstar and talking about um, computer sound. And then we also are planning on talking about um, looking at the latest, um, uh, the latest Pac-Man port that's going on right now too, you know? Uh, so Nick, and, and by the way, Nick is, is Gunstar uh, able to be accessed from the Nick Marentes project site? Because I think I looked for that in the past and didn't see it. Uh, not in the project site. No, I only put um, the completed projects in that. It's only from the blog because it's in development. Okay, okay. So then in that case, I'll have to put a separate link to that um, uh, on my page because I wasn't sure. I, I tried finding it on, yeah. your, on your main page and I didn't find it. Okay. Yeah, once it's completed, th there will be a project entry, but it's not finished yet. He just does that to it, make it an extra work project for Steve. So <laughs> <laughs> it's still vaporware. <laughs> vaporware. Oh man. So yeah. So this is your latest blog entry where you're really getting into talking about um, how you want to produce sound on here. And I and I haven't finished finished reading it yet. But do you want to give us the short version of this since we have you on the phone? Um. VCC. No, no. It's <laughs> Nitrous 9. <laughs> Nitrous 9. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Not a lot. It's only a small chapter. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a, a lot of work in the background to, um, um, to, to, to get to this point. I mean, uh, trying to, uh, well, you've got to find the right sound samples to, um, to use. Uh, mm -hmm. That, 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 
um, bent trawling the uh, internet looking for sa- <laughs> for sound samples, and of which there's thousands of them on the net. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah. it's a matter of finding the right ones, the ones that aren't too long, the ones that are have that right sound. Uh, collecting all those, then I had to um, write software to uh, import them into the color computer. Uh, downscale them from usually 16-bit sounds down to, well, 6-bit sounds, uh, trimming them so they're not too long because I, you know, getting all the samples to fit into memory, uh, allocating a uh, memory block for it, getting the program in its current state to load it, and then writing a sound routine to, uh, to play them. And what I did in this uh, current version is I've set up uh, in the program buttons that you can press one to whatever and you press those and it triggers a specific sound sample okay. and it, let, it lets you press two buttons so because it's got a two two vo- uh, two channel sound generator okay. it will um, whichever button I press it allocates the new sound onto the next available uh, free channel which isn't being used. Okay. So you can actually press a button twice and it'll play it twice. Neat. If Yeah, so it, it's to simulate what it will look, sound like in the sure. actual game. And um, part of the test also, invo- it doesn't show it in the um, sample I did there, but part of the test was actually having the uh, memory copy routine that I had uh, in the last chapter, the one that was taking up so much um CPU time. Okay. I actually had that running as well as the sound routine. So, you know, I wanted to see what what putting the two most CPU um, uh, intensive tasks to see how much time they both took up, uh, how much time I was left over for the game, and whether everything worked um, correctly together, uh, w- which it all did. So. The sound effects test that you hear there is just um, just the sound that you're hearing, but the video, well, the, the computer is actually doing the, the big copy from the previous chapter as well. So if you want to run the sample. Yeah. I'll have to share I, audio with you guys. I'll have to share the audio, yeah. Yeah. Object collected. I like that. Smart Blum Energy. (laughs) That sounded like somebody rage quitting meme. (laughs) <laughs> That's right, <laughs> <laughs> and they won. <laughs> that sounds and, like a uh, real space shooter, right there. That's awesome. Yeah, well, that that's the whole idea. And uh, as the chapter said, "Look, Ma, no sound chip." Yeah. That's well, that's amazing. one thing I want to discuss. Like, what is the what is the advantages and disadvantages of of the sound chip projects versus doing the digitized sound? And I think that's. The, and I need a nice thing to cover because there's advantages and disadvantages to each depending on what you want to do in your game. That's right. Now, the, the, for sound effects, it's great. You can just take a digital sample of something that sounds like a real explosion or a real um, um, gunfire or even someone speaking. You have a real voice if you want. Uh, and the sound routine plays those sounds. Uh, so that sounds a lot better than than the the basic sound chips that you have. You can easily tell uh, something that uses uh, the sound chip versus something that uses real real sounds. The disadvantage, though, is that is it is a CPU intensive um, um, task. You, the the computer has to run the sound routine via interrupts in the background as well as the actual game. And uh, depending on the game, if, if you have a game that uses itself uses a lot of CPU cycles, then you have very little left over for the sound. Uh, as it is, I've got it, I've got it set to do a two channel two two voices. Uh, when I try to include music, well, that started becoming 
just a bit too much. Um, and the only way to try to get around that is to lower the actual playback rate or the sample rate of the sound. But then you can get away with the lower sample rate when you have gunshots and explosions and stuff because they are generally a fairly rough sound. But when you're playing music, it's very it doesn't sound very good when you lower the fidelity of, of a note, of a musical note, for example. Then it really starts sounding bad. So... Um, it was a choice. Do I want to have sound effects or do, wanna, or do I want to have music? And I figured there's no way I want to play the game without the gunshots and the, the general mayhem that you hear. That, that's a priority one. That has to go in there. Music, uh, that is where a sound chip comes in handy because a sound chip takes over the burden of uh, all that CPU um, um, interaction that's needed to play music is is most of that's taken over by the sound chip that can then generate a more high fidelity uh, tone. Um, now the problem is the problem I was thinking is okay well maybe I can just have a mixture of both. Why not have the digital sound samples coming out of the DAC since I can do some really great sound effects there and have support for a sound chip. So if you have a sound chip or a sound cartridge or whatever, yeah. then you've got the best of both worlds. You've got yeah. great sound effects, and you can have great music playing in the background. If you don't have a sound cartridge, well, at least you'll have the great sound effects. Problem, you can't mix the sound from the cartridge port via the cartridge connector called sound in. You can't mix that sound source with the DAC, it's one or the other. The only way to mix them is that you've got to run external cables from the sound cartridge out, mm. mixed in with the uh, audio coming out of the color computer, mix them in and put them into the same cable, or just you know have run a se separate set of um, amplifiers in order to have both sounds um, running. So yeah, it's it's a real problem that you can't mix. The, uh, both of them have the best of both worlds running at once. So currently I'm running the game just using the, the DAC sound samples because I really do like the sound effects. Um, I, I, I don't think that the uh, sound chips, well, the current sound chips can actually make that sort of sound. Um, well, well, they can. You can use the sound chip sort of like a DAC, but then that defeats the whole purpose of um, of uh, um, saving CPU cycles because uh, that would be CPU intensive if you wanted to try play a sample. Um, so for this for this project at this stage, I'm going to use the DAC. Okay. So that's the plus and minuses of using either. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's, that's one thing I want to get into because, like you said, if you you can have really good digital effects which take a lot of CPU time, or if you have a game that you know you want to concentrate solely on graphics, and you want a musical background, you can run the sound chip and basically it takes n almost no CPU time at all. But we have no current easy way to mix both because of the limitations of the way the sounds routed through the color computer or the limitations of the sound chips themselves. I mean, there's some newer sound chips that somebody could incorporate oh, yeah. that can handle this kind of stuff. But yeah. as far as I know, nobody's doing that at this point. And a lot That's of people right. want, you know, period-specific type sound chips, like the ones that were available back in the 80s. Um, if that limitation was lifted and somebody used a newer one, then you might be able to tell the chip, you know, do some samples or load some samples to the chip and have it play it in the background too, which would kind of be the best of both worlds, but more costly. Yeah, I think a lot of the arcade machines back in the day that used, um, say, the, the same chips as the, what we're seeing now, usually had a second processor running those chips as well. So you, you could create more complicated sound effects by devoting another CPU solely to control the sound chips. So you could get really good sound, but you know you are talking about a multiprocessor board layout. We unfortunately only have one processor that's trying to do everything. So mm. uh, everything plus the fact we don't have sprites, we don't have uh, all these other fancy things that a lot of the uh, proper arcade machines may have had. So our CPU is doing a lot of work. So mm. Yeah, it, it's unfortunate and it's also impressive when you're able to overcome all those limitations. You know? Well, that's the challenge, you know. Okay, they're, they're the limitations. How can we um, um, overturn them? 
Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. But I mean, it's it's just great to know that commercial quality games are still being developed. You know, we have Rick Adams working on stuff. We have John Strawn working on stuff. We have we have Nick Morentis. Um, probably a good segue to switch over and look at the the Pac Man that's in uh, in development too. That's one of the things we are talking about uh, wanting to show too. So this is Glenn um, Hewlett is working on porting um, the arcade Pac-Man to the Coco, um, uh, what he calls transcoding, which is similar to what Sockmaster did for Donkey Kong, where you basically take all the original Z80 code and you rewrite it to run on the Coco in 6809 assembly and then having to emulate a few pieces of hardware that aren't there. So it's a similar project to kind of like porting Donkey Kong to the Coco. And this is his latest video that he posted where he's showing the real um, Pac-Man running next to the Coco Pac-Man. And you notice some very slight timing differences. And it has to do with the timing refresh of the various screens. Where I think he said the arcade screen ran at like 60.66 megahertz. And the Coco is a, is a hard 60. So we we fall out of sync a little bit. But it's not even a question of the CPU at this point. But here's the screen. And on the right is the real Pac-Man running in MAME. And on the left is... Uh, the Coco Pac-Man running in MAME, and you'll see that they start off being about the same speed, but the one on the left starts to get a little tiny bit behind, but not by much. And and again, if you weren't watching these things side by side, you'd probably never notice it, you know. Um, yeah. But just and the other thing to notice is the vertical scrolling, because you ver right, which is yeah. neat. That's that's a pretty clever thing to do because most people just um, shrink the screen to fit to the Coco resolution, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was no sound there, but it's definitely interesting, and it's come a long way because in some of his earlier um, videos, the ghosts weren't even individually colored. They all started off being around the same color, so now he's got these ghosts in different colors. It's looking like they're moving in front of and behind each other, so his sprite routines are definitely fleshing out some more as well. Um, I think the only thing it's missing right now is some of the text, like the credit zero on the bottom and the high score and stuff on the top, which is... Probably doable, but probably lower uh, lower on the priority scale. Um, but it's definitely cool stuff. A lot of cool projects happening right now. Um, a lot of cool stuff. A lot of, a lot of good reasons to be excited about your Coco. <laughs> yeah. And it's also, it finally fills Sockmaster's you know, dream when he released Donkey Kong. He wanted to see other people try to port real arcade games like he did and it, it right. took a decade but we're starting to see it there's also the toot in common one that's partly yes, ported run yes, side yes. it doesn't mark, have sound but it mark looks really McDougal good too. is porting things too like night like night yeah. and things like that yeah space invaders there was a project where space invaders was getting ported um so yeah now it's we're, very we cool. actually have our own coco mame now it's a lot easier to use <laughs> we could <laughs> emulate games on the coco itself so Pretty cool stuff. Wayne Campbell has joined us. Hey, Wayne, how are you? Glad you could make it. Um, yeah, good stuff. So I, I, I think we've we've talked about a lot of things today. We've definitely um, <laughs> we definitely dug into all that is Mame. Um, I think what I will wait to do is when um, Mame one eight seven becomes official, I'll probably do a video then and and just you know how to get Mame running on a Coco and then you know. I think some of the some of the things you do in MAME are better served by running the launch script, the command line script, where you can specify some of these parameters all in one shot and not have to do tweaks to it. Um, but, you know, to each their own. And um, I definitely can see the benefit of using the, the um, MAME UI, which is the kind of shell wrapper interface for MAME or MESS that makes it a little bit easier to get to it and gives you that top menu bar. The media menu where you can um, insert a disk is definitely easier than the native um, MAME user interface. The ability to copy and paste from that drop-down menu is also a nice little feature. So those are kind of like some training wheels that kind of soften um, the curve and soften the um, process to doing it. And uh, those definitely need to be acknowledged and applauded. Um, and you just you just have to bear in mind that they need to they need to be relatively in sync with the main the, the main release as well, so you have full benefit of whatever new features come along. But um, yeah, nice touch having that added user interface to the systems. Yeah, and hopefully it gets ported to the Mac and Linux pretty soon too, so they can enjoy the same better ease of use. 
Oh yeah, that's that's interesting that the UI is a Windows only thing, huh? Yeah, I mean, way back when uh, Mac Mame used to have the best user interface of them all. It was dead easy, and then when they switched to SDL, that just all disappeared. And I haven't looked to see whether anybody's doing an active port of it or not. Bill, you were mentioning that you were kind of familiar with it. Do you know if is there a port being made of the Mess UI for well, Mac OS X and, and Linux? Well, there is the SDL MS interface, but that's quite far behind in the versions of the actual meme uh, involved. Uh, it's kind of a well, probably about th two or three years out of date. <laughs> oh, years? Okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, we're talking years. <laughs> Yeah, I actually stopped using that SDL mess and just used the raw interface for now until someone or somebody actually uh, creates one. Okay. Gotcha. I'm cheating. I'm just running the Windows version under uh, Fusion under Mac, Mac OS X, so I'm kind of running Windows and Mac at the same time and mess under that. Yeah, I do have it that way as well, but for when I'm actually doing it straight on the Mac side, I just use the straight command line command interface. Line. Okay. Right. What what is a nice thing about um, some of these enhancements to MAME too is that if you're going to do the Raspberry Pi implementation of the Cocoa, which is based on MAME, these new features will get rolled out to that as well. So the support for the speech sound cartridge will be there. The support for um, uh, you know the uh, Super Game module will be there. So some of these newer um, features will automatically be um, rolled into and be part of the Cocoa Pie project too, which is kind of cool. So there's some benefits to having that consistent platform. And Cocoa Pie, which is running on a Raspberry Pi, which is a flavor of Linux, uh, is kind of a testament to the kind of, uh, for all the things that suck about MAME, the fact that it's cross-platform uh, compatible and you can run MAME on Linux and Raspberry Pi and Mac OS and Windows, that is definitely a nice feature that is missing from VCC. The other, uh, other nice thing about MAME is that it's actively developed. Now, sometimes that backfires and somebody breaks something on a release, yeah. <laughs> but it's actively being updated all the time. So yeah. you, you have a good chance of getting bugs fixed, good chance of new features being added. And that's one of the problems that VCC and some of the other ones have had too. So yeah, they're not being and, and so and the and I think because of the complexity of Mame, it's I think it's real easy to consider something a bug when it might not even be. Like I know there's been a few postings saying, "Well, I couldn't get this one thing to work with DriveWire or this weird non-standard ROM in my disk controller and things like that." I don't consider that a bug when you're trying to do something that's a little bit hacky. Um, you know, it, it's not a bug when it emulates the operating system and 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 again i think for every question or challenge you're trying to do there's probably an answer and there are people out there that could direct us to those answers because i believe there is a way to specify a custom rom cartridge to a disk controller it's just knowing all the dashes and slashes and spaces to put in that launcher command to make it happen but it's it's doable um is it elegant? No. No, there were definitely some cool things in VCC that I learned uh, from David Ladd, how you can change your the BIOS of your disk controller. And we can, you know, there are some very elegant things that VCC does. Um, that there are things we could tear apart that VCC doesn't do, too. I, I would prefer not to bash any product because there are people who are working on them. Um, these are people's products and people's projects. And I don't want to bash the person who works on them. We can sit here and say, yeah, this is there's things I would like it to have or not have. But when it comes to something like VCC, it's a kind of a small homegrown thing. And if you're going to start to tear that apart, well, then you're starting to step on the toes and feelings of a few people of the community that I would prefer not to do. Um, when it comes to MAME, well, it's a big animal, right? So there's a thousand people on there. So yeah, we could technically piss all over MAME and <laughs> not be <laughs> not be offending any one person. But again, I, I would prefer to treat these projects with a little bit of respect and just appreciate what they do as, a fo as opposed to always complain about what they don't, you know? And then hopefully through conversations and, and dialogues, we can move forward and get some of these other features uh, smoothed out over time, you know? Yeah. And we want to encourage development. I mean, and, and, and development from beginners too. Like you don't have to be able to write a game like Nick. You can write a basic game. Mm -hmm. Like just start at your own level and, and you know, Work your ask way. for some help to, you know, to make it better or faster or whatever you need to do. And I don't think we should bash people doing beginners projects or anything else no, either for no. the same reason. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, but yeah, there are, there are a handful of emulators 
for the color computer. Some are very specific, like VCC and XROR are very specific. Um, and then you have something like MAME, which is such a broad spectrum uh, application that we're trying to use for a very focused solution. And the nature of it makes it hard for it to be a focused product. Um, but I think there's, again, there's pros and cons to everything. And there's, you're probably going to get a more quicker response and release on XROR and MAME than you will on VCC. There definitely appears to be a huge um, latency in VCC project um, enhancements. I think the last person who said he was working on it was um, Jason Ross. And he says he's got some plans, but his plans are two years out before they're going to be public. So there's a very short list of people working on VCC. Um, you know, I, I remember a long time ago, I had asked the question, and again, I, I like to ask these theoretical pie in the sky questions. Why couldn't we take all these people and make them all work together on the one super emulator? Why not get the extra people and the VCC people and the main people and figure out all the pieces that are perfect and let's take let's cherry pick the best cores and drivers and emulations and let's build the super coco emulator that would be a, it's a it's a cool wish to ask for but does it make sense you know are there benefits to doing that and and who knows you know yeah was, i well, mean I think, go ahead yeah, well one of the things i was going to say is especially when you were showing the mess ui is if you was to, um, since MAME, when you build it, you can still build MAME for just the MESS components. And then you can build that just for the COCO-related stuff only. Mm -hmm. If you could do that with the MESS UI, and, you know, if MESS UI had its own little more enhancements that were specific for people that, you know, want the ease like VCC that should be doable, you know, because right now, Mess UI, from what you showed me, gives almost the same feel that VCC had. Right, minus the direct man manipulation of the multi-pack. Right, the, and if that was something missing. that was added, you know, then, you know, there's a lot of stuff that would save time. Plus, MAME has that built-in... Uh, debugger, which for developers would be extremely handy. Yes, <laughs> I've been using it quite a bit lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do doesn't VCC actually have the uh, multi-pack? It does. Yeah, oh, VCC has got. Yeah, VCC has got a very cool multi-pack GUI where you can change the slider and you can selectively insert um, different DLL files into the different cartridge yeah. slots, or or so. insert a cartridge ROM into one of those slots. So yeah, VCC does the best job of making the MPI user-friendly. But, yeah. but there's no developers out there to actually create more new devices as such, so. Mm, at the moment. Not like SSC cartridge, there's no one developing that device for it. Not at the moment, but I think Tim Lindner no. also said that because it's now been developed in MAME, if somebody wanted to take that and just give credit to the MAME source where it came from, they're free to redo it. But whoever they are and when they are going to do it is also another question. Yeah, so um, it depends on the development environment between the two too. Like how easy it is going to be to translate MAME code, which is written to be multi-platform, onto something like VCC, mm -hmm. which I think is Visual Studio or something. Um, it was original Visual Studio version six, which trust me is a pain in the rump to get working on newer Windows. Um, but yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. yeah. So when I started my journey and when I started doing YouTube videos and trying to find color computer emulators, I started on VCC because it was the easiest to understand. It was the easiest to literally hit the ground running with. And a good, you know, 60 to 80 of some of my original videos were all done in VCC. And, and it was, I think it was Curtis or somebody who left a comment one time and said, hey, what, uh, you know, what emulator are you using? Because some of these colors here look a little off, especially on the game of... Um, that was me. Uh, Clowns and Balloons, or it was Shooting Gallery. Shooting Gallery is one of those games that did a really good job of taking all these artifact colors and creating bl greens and blues and purples and other kind of pseudo-faux colors um, that VCC just could not handle. VCC takes, um, you know, what, what we call red on the Cocoa, P mode for a screen is kind of an orange uh, and the blue is kind of a sky blue and and with VCC it's kind of a very 
dark um, dark red, like a blood red and like a navy blue. So those colors aren't quite the same and it doesn't do anything to create the kind of faux colors, the dithered colors of like checkerboarding red and white to create orange and red and black to create brown and all those other fancy tricks and hacks and stuff. So um, that's where XROAR does a really good job. And ironically, XROAR's artifact emulation they took from MAME. Right, so XROAR's emulation came from MAME, MAME so XROAR and MAME do the do the best job of emulating those artifact colors, you know, um, where VCC does not do well in that area, but it does very well doing any of the red, green, blue, P mode three stuff. It does really good doing Coco three stuff. Uh, I believe it was recently discovered that there is some issues with the 6309 emulation on it where I think there were some discussions about how basic 09 and again the things that we report as bugs or glitches um, sometimes you it's it's hard to know what the truth is when you're not running something on real hardware what's the problem uh, is it the software is it the emulator and it takes somebody with a little bit more knowledge to really pinpoint what that was but I believe that was discovered to be an actual 6309 issue yeah the divide divide commands the hardware divide commands in the 639 emulation VCC were not working yeah, yeah. So again, and, and we're, not, we're not trying to piss on that project, but the, I guess the moral of the story is, is none of them are perfect. You know, we're all going to have yeah. our favorites. Yeah, as far as VCC goes with the 6309, I went through the um, source code for the 6309, and there's actually quite a few instructions that are not implemented okay. in the source code. So there's if if you're developing for to do 6309 stuff and it doesn't work, I would probably suggest trying it on a real Coco to verify first before you start blaming your own code or another application if it's not working because it's a possibility you found one of those instructions that aren't implemented yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a little bit of chat going on here too in the um, in the in the actual text chat. So um, some discussions on VCC and XROAR and MAME. One of the questions was about the licensing for MAME, which I don't know how to answer. Um, uh, but I think I think MAME has loosened up its licensing um, a lot recently too because. Um, uh, the ability to distribute MAME with Linux distributions and things like that, I think, is definitely been loosened up. Um, and then uh, 6809E is saying XWAR artifact colors originally ripped off from MAME. Now it does a low pass filtering and pretty dynamic NTSC emulation. It kind of does. When there are some very fine tuned options to the artifacting now you can get out of XWAR um, uh, as far as, um, and, and it's using math. And science to um, calculate those artifacts so it's not just um, software effects simile it's more you know kind of um, what's the word it's going more of like an algorithm now to generate the artifacts that's a little bit truer to analog stuff and I think both of those were originally based on work Sockmaster had done to figure out how to do that yeah yeah and I think Sockmaster had mentioned that he's the one who, who introduced the artifact code to MAME and he c tried to keep it simple uh, yeah, so actually, he had a more complicated one, but it would take more CPU overhead to okay. So to he just do tried, it, but... tried to keep it simple. So, so there might be better ways to artifact out there. But the ones that are out there now really don't suck. Uh, no, they're pretty close. If you put it next to a real Coco on a, a TV or a composite monitor. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think we all have our favorites, and there's nothing wrong with with uh, being a fanboy of a particular emulator. Um, I, I I just like I would like people to have an open mind and say, well, if you haven't tried it, give it a shot. And yeah, we you can nitpick at some of the things that aren't elegant about it, but um, I think it offers a solid platform for somebody who's interested in trying to emulate something on a cartridge. Uh, to be able to do that. And I would, I'm assuming VCC can probably do that too. But um, I, I, think it's, I think it's definitely a, probably a very good development platform to use MAME uh, besides testing out new hardware but the debugging and things like that. So, um, And it's there. So what people do with it, it's kind of up to them at this point, I think. Yeah, if you had to be generalized about it, I would say that VCC is, is good for the people that you know just want to fire up old Coco games or old Coco programs and just run them. Yeah. Freeze it for these views, and then MAME. If you're a developer and you want to start targeting some of this new hardware that's coming out, or even some of the hardware that's already out, uh, it, that's probably better because of the debugger and everything else. So, 
Gotcha. Well, we were just joined by Tandy themselves. Hey, Tandy, love your products. Uh, Tandy says MAME is now GPL2, and so it can be modified and redistributed very easily now. Okay, that's the general public license. Is that what GPL stands for? Are there yep. the GNU or GNOME or general public, one of those G-sounding words? GNU, GNOME, GNITE, GNITE. <laughs> Ah, so that was that was Darren Grant from his Tandy account. Okay, hey Darren. <laughs> <laughs> well, Darren and Tandy, we kind of associate you as being the same thing. So, Mr. Tandy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so I think we're done beating the emulator to death at this point, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. What else do we want to talk about before we wrap up this talk? Um, how about disk formatting? How about disk formatting? <laughs> Anybody have any experience in that arena? <laughs> Such a random yeah, topic think... to pull out of the air. <laughs> <laughs> Only something I've been screwing with for the last month. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, is, there any, yeah. is, there, is there anything you can show us through a screen share, or does it just have to be a discussion? Um, it would probably have to be a discussion, because I think it's going to be kind of hard for... Um, uh, for me to show on the real stuff because I've got my images not prepared for it. Um, okay. But um, something that I was doing back in the time, which um, I'd forgotten about, which thanks to Curtis brought it um, to the foreground um, of my memory, which was a utility for OS 9, which was a modified format command called Format 20, which allows you to get two extra sectors on a track when you're formatting it. So instead of 1 through 18, you get 1 through 20. And um, now there's been some discussions that Curtis had said that some people had issues with this um, not being very reliable. Well, it's only not reliable if you're using um, marginal floppy disks, which there, you know, back then there were some companies that didn't use very good magnetic media. So, um, but from the testing I've had with the floppies I own, I've not had any issues with formatting the extra two sectors um, on the floppy. So on like an 80-track uh, floppy, you can get um, very, right about 800K on a 720K floppy disk, formatting the extra two sectors. Yeah, I mean, if you have a 40-track double-sided, you go from 360 to 400K. Even if you have, like, a 40-track single-sided, you go from 180 to 200K, so you're gaining extra room. So <clears throat> there's there's benefits, and it's really useful if you're doing backups, um, if you're space-limited, um, because especially when you're dealing with OS 9 and you're wanting all the tools that you... the power tools that you want, you want to fit it all on one disk, you know... You, you want to squeeze every inch, every bit of bits that you can get in that space mm -hmm. onto that track. And um, and I went so far as I wanted to know how this worked. And Curtis says, well, you could use disassembler and just take a look. And I'm like, well, okay. So I dasmed it. And I'm like, well, then I compared it to two Nitrous 9's format command. And I started looking at the headers. And then I went went to Western Digital's documents to look at the Western Digital 1770X specifications. And then once I started looking at what they did with the F, the Format 20, I'm like, what the heck? The specs don't match up. <laughs> so they're definitely doing some bit hackery during the, the formatting to get the, the 20 sectors. Now, using... Western Digital specifications, I was able to squeeze out 19 sectors, but when I started fudging the numbers based on specifications, everything went to hell and it broke. So some of their numbers they played with, I'm like, it doesn't match what technically you're supposed to be doing, and I'm like confused at how, how they managed to get it working, but it, it works. So it's, it's certainly impressive what you can do. And you can emulate that on the Coco SDC, VCC, 
and XROR. Because um, the Coco SDC, you can use an SDF disk image, which will store the track data for the disk image, which means then you can for simulate this special formatting on the Coco SDC. Uh, okay. With VCC and XROR, you can use a disk image format called DMK, which is what the SDF disk image is based on. And um, sadly, right now, MAME um, doesn't support writing to a DMK disk image yet. I'm hoping a certain individual will fix that. <laughs> okay. It does read them, though, correctly, right? It reads yes. them, yeah. I ran into this issue when I had first started doing stuff on VCC. I didn't even know I could create a generic floppy from scratch in an emulator. So I had downloaded a blank floppy from the Color Computer Archive, and I guess the one I downloaded was a DMK formatted one. I could not even get that to open in XROAR. I found I could, I could not get it to open in um, the uh, SDC. I could get it to open in MAME as read-only, and I could get it to open in VCC, but not XROAR. Now, maybe my XROAR is out of date. I'm not sure. But um, I had an issue even with that. But, yeah, there's definitely – it's just another um, – it's that, a, another format. I know there's a handful of formats now. It would be nice if we can get these formats on the same page with our emulators and with our hardware devices. Yes, that's uh, one of the things, because with all this testing I've been doing, which you can – Ask Curtis. Um, I've been messaging him a lot during this whole playing around. Um, but um, XROAR, you have to make sure if it's a DMK disk image that it's the extension is DMK. Um, and uh, I, I think the same is with MAME. It has to be DMK. Yeah. VCC... Um, even if you try when you create a disk image and you try to call it whatever your name dot dmk it it changes your extension uh, to so dsk you, mm. so no matter what you set the extension to it keeps automatically changing the extension to dot dsk so um i i need to post that as one of the things that might need to be changed in a future once ever that gets around um, but yeah, um, for like keep MAME the extension and XROR, as, keep the extension right. as DMK so we know what it is. Yes. Um, now there are, uh, another disk image format that you can specify, um, a header on it that will give you the extra sectors, um, which is the JVC, which, um, what MAME, uh, creates a JVC f disk image, but it doesn't stick the header on it by default. But you can add the header later if you need it for, you know, special floppies. Um, and VCC uh, supports that. Um, XROAR is supposed to, but when I tried to do these specially formatted floppies with XROAR, XROAR crashes. It just, it literally blows up. Um and uh, the Coco SDC um, on the web page says it only supports uh, the JVC only in relations to how many heads. It does not it honor the the, how many how many sectors are in the JVC file. So, like if in for instance, if I told it I wanted a twenty sector two head per track. Um, JVC, it ignores how many sectors. So it's so, it's, it's something that's warned up front because he says JVC only thing that's used is the heads. So you just kind of have to go with the flow on some of this stuff. What is the main benefit to doing this on I, I get it if you're doing real hardware and you want to squeeze as many bytes onto the physical floppy as possible to conserve mediums. What's the benefit of doing this when with emulation and Coco SDC, our capacity is virtually limitless? The, 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 the main reason is if you're transferring between real floppies to Coco SDC or emulators. Like if you don't want to have to try you know, manually copy every file off from a bigger format real floppy onto, say, a hard drive image or something like that. 
Um, this way, you can actually just back up the disks. Okay, so know. if you've got a real-world physical floppy that is formatted with these extra tracks, it would be nice to be able to copy those to a virtual disk and maintain yeah. that format. Okay, that I understand. Yeah, yeah I'm just. I I'm mean, the main reason for it is to give real hardware more room. Um, like if you have any real floppy, whether it's a three and a half or a five and a quarter, whether it's single sided or double sided, as long as it works on the Coco, you can get some extra room out of it. Right. Um, it, it, does this also is this also related to how certain copy protection would work because they're using other tracks that a normal situation would not account for? Um, yes, in two <coughs> two ways. Um, the DMK and the SDF will support uh, information that is hidden in your track data, um, which is how some copy protection is. Um, there's others where when they format a track, they'll actually change um, a sector number. So like for instance, let's say in set, you know, you have sector one through 18, but let's change sector nine on one track to be sector 19. So that way disk basic, when you try to back up the disk, errors out sector mm. missing so you can't back up the disc gotcha um you know or they change the size of the sector so so your sector 19 could be 512 bytes instead of 256 you know there's different tricks that you could do for copy protection um or even better yet with this 19 or 20 extra you know the total sectors on a track you could hide your extra data for copy protection in those extra two sectors that people wouldn't know that are there so if they're backing up well the backup command just said it successfully backed up the entire disk but it missed two sectors on every every track and now when they run it as a backup it don't work right 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 you got a broken copy yeah, DICOM was rather famous for this because they did half the disk with 10, 24 byte sectors, and then they used odd sector numbers on other parts of the disk. And basically, the only track that was left completely alone was, I think, the uh, directory track. Interesting. Very interesting. So, yeah, it's a cool little, it's basically, this is like floppy hackery, is what it sounds yep. like. And, <laughs> Pretty much. and, and floppy, exactly. hack, ha floppy hackery definitely existed during the time of the real physical floppies and now we're working on and on other to... platforms too i mean the amiga yeah. and some other ones also yeah. use the same type of tricks so now we're just trying to create the modern digital electronic equivalent of that or at least implement it somehow through emulation and stuff yeah the yeah. dmk disk image format is actually um from what i was doing what little research i saw on that disk image format it's actually used elsewhere as well it's not just for the coco stuff yes so um, it, was, it was one of the defaults on the cat weasel board which is a hardware board you could put into a pc that basically would copy any floppy format you know mm. in demand interesting um, and basically i use that like actually to create some of the dmk uh games that you see on the coco archive uh that were copy protected and, and hadn't been broken or, or cracked yet that was how some of those were made actually i had one on loan so that DMK format, because DMK is currently not supported by the Coco SDC, you are limited to one of the one or two emulators that supports it right now to run those particular... Uh, well, the, the SDF format is kind of DMK with a header change or header add-on. I can't remember if it's added to or just changed. It, it basically will handle the same thing, and I think that works on the Coco SDC. So you can... There's a little converter util. You can convert a DMK to an SDF, and then it should work. Ah, you just can't run, run the raw DMK on it. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and um, one of the things that then if you convert a, like for instance, if you're doing these backups, like what I've been doing all this testing, um, right now, um, SDF is only supported on the Coco SDC. I'm hoping that maybe that will get ported over to MAME and maybe to VCC and XROAR. VCC will probably be <clears throat> yeah, an be eon, lot. but he'll probably yeah. eventually get in there. But it's more than likely it will eventually be seen in XROAR and MAME. Okay. Interesting. It's an interesting little... Uh, yeah, it's a cool little... I mean, if we're going to emulate stuff, 
and we're emulating hardware, it'd be interesting that we can emulate even the ways we hack hardware, you know? So um, that is kind of cool. I think, uh, you know, the fact that we can emulate all these different things is pretty cool, or, you know, we can at least start to push in that direction to get them included in these emulation projects. And in this case, you're emulating what the real 1773 or 1793 disk controller chip could do. Because yeah. it can do 128, 256, 512, 10, 24 byte sectors. Mm -hmm. and, and just to give a very brief tech explanation how the 20 sector trick works, when you have a track formatted, it's basically every track's the same size in bytes. But there's padding between each sector, and there's a little sector header that says, that, okay, we're going to call this sector number one. We're going to call this one number two. That's where the copper protection would suddenly start using wonky numbers that weren't contiguous. But basically all this thing does is it takes the number of extra padding bytes between each sector and just shrinks it. So if it was, I can't remember what the exact numbers are, say it was 40 bytes of padding, now it's 30. And there's a certain threshold if you go too far down that it starts becoming unreliable. But through a lot of testing back in the 80s, we discovered that the 20 sectors was quite reliable i mean our system at work we used that same format for 10 years backing up and never had problems unless we had bad floppies hmm. and i also use that same utility which you know i'd forgotten about because it's been you know 20 plus years since i had originally been using the real hardware until the last couple of years um but yeah it, it, i was using it back then without any issues except for you know, when I buy those off-brand cheap floppies, and then that's, you know, you buy you what you pay, pay for. for. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. It'd be um, like buying a VIC-20. It's the same type of thing. So, you get what you pay for. Right, Sorry. right, right, right. <laughs> but, but, but it's something that if, if, if you want to experiment with how, if you're writing software and you want to see how could high have copy protected it back in the day, you could simulate it still with the Coco SDC if if you're you know don't have a working real floppy drive, you can simulate it on the Coco SDC or VCC or XROR and hopefully soon with MAME. Okay, well, it's <laughs> so. sound like it'll come to XROR too, because six six eight oh nine E is saying yes, SDF is definitely coming. Probably as soon as I recover SDC from the loft, <laughs> he's get his <laughs> SDC down. So the oh, eight... so so six eight oh nine E is Kieran. It's sixty, then. yes, yeah. sixty. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we're getting it from the source at this point. <laughs> okay, it's well coming. that's good to know. <laughs> it's coming, yes. And so he says that it, it that the HXC floppy emulator uses a nice format that's just MFM. Uh, transition data so that will be coming that's good to know uh, yeah um, and Darren I should mention saying, too like I was talking about the base or basic 9 decompiler earlier and Wayne Campbell who's now in the chat is the author of that ah Wayne there we go hey Wayne we were talking about you earlier too <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> so yeah there there that's that's definitely cool um so many names, the, it's hard to keep up with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, Sixie, since, since since you heard me, um, I did find a bug. <laughs> <laughs> so, but... Uh, Way to call him out on the air, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the, be at the beginning of the show, Wayne, we, uh, Curtis started off by mentioning the DCOM project and that it's being worked on again. Oh, DCOM's the original name. But DCOM's yeah, the original yeah. name, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sixty <laughs> says I heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it you know, is... it's a nice problem having all these names to remember because, to be honest, we're getting more and more people back into the community. And some of the ones that, like Wayne, have been around for decades uh, ago are now back into it, too. So this is it's, it's nice to have this problem rather than we're dwindling down to two or three people left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I forgot how John Level, how John Linville put it one time. Like, we're just showing up to see who's not dead this year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's like the more call. It's, uh, celebrity death watch or whatever. Yeah, right, uh, the death pool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, man. well. Plus, also having these talks and getting people back and having everybody, you know, conversing on these different emulators too can maybe hope to get 
uh, a common feature base between them all as well. You know, since we've got for the real Cocos, the Coco SDC getting support from some of the features it has into the emulators that we all currently use um, is also a good thing. So Yeah, definitely. We're going to see if we can get Wayne to join us here. And we're going to wrap this one up here in just a minute, too, because my stomach is now um, telling me that it's time to eat. <laughs> I think we have reached the, the average two-hour time, although we have gone longer in the past. Yeah, it would be nice to see if we can get Wayne on the call here real quick. Um, the one challenge with, with doing this is that if we're doing this through the Skype group, we keep reaching that ceiling of, of capacity of how many members are in the group. So that's a, at some point in time, you might, you guys, as long as I can have everybody as a friend of mine, as long as you're a contact to me in Skype, I can just add you to any random call. We're probably going to have to get to that point where um, we'll just have people continue to call me and I'll add you to the call. But I can only add somebody to an existing call if they are already um, contacts with me. And in the case of the Coco Talk, I don't think we can add anybody else to this now because we've reached that 24 user limit for this group that we have to keep juggling um, people in and out of. Um, but yeah, it'd be good to get you on, Wayne. Um, if you want to try to send a friend, if you want to try to send me a friend request on Skype, I'll see if I can get you in right now. O OG Stevie Stro is the name. Um, if I click on recent, I don't know how I can see who's at, who's adding me right now. Um, I'm not super Skype literate, but we'll see what I can figure out here. Uh, am I missing anything in Skype right now, guys? Anything on the text chat? Because I just typically don't, I, I watch it full screen. I don't usually look at the chat. There hasn't been okay. too much in there. Just right. a, yep, a few uh, things from way Wayne back. says I'm having trouble getting my Skype started. Well, we'll, we'll definitely try to take it offline. So I'm just going to put out here my email. Um, And that my actual Skype ID is just OG Stevie Stro. Um, so if you can add that in the future, Wayne, um, we'd love to get you in here and get you on uh, a, a future Coco Talk. Um, cool stuff. Yeah, so floppy, uh, just squeezing more bits and bytes out of our floppy. That's kind of cool. It's kind of like, you know, when you do anything retro, it's just everybody's got their own shade of crazy. Like, yeah, I, you know, I could sit here and say, well, that's kind of a crazy project. Why do you want to do a freaking floppy? Somebody else can look at me working on basic and say, well, what kind of crazy idiots working on basic? It sucked 35 years ago. Why are you using it now? You know, so <laughs> it hasn't sucked any less. <laughs> it's still <laughs> slow. Why are you doing that? So we all find what interests us. And that's kind of the cool thing about this hobby is that. Everybody's got a different interest on what they want to do, and everything we do, I think, kind of fuels the fires. Yeah. Um, I, I, the nice thing about the floppy thing is that we have some people in, in the group that don't do the emulation stuff. They want to run on the real hardware, and this is a trick that actually works on the real hardware, and it gives you, like, a bonus extra space per disk under OS9 or Nitrostein, So. Oh, really? It won't, it won't do it under RS-DOS at all? It, it will, but you'd have to patch BASIC because BASIC has no idea there could be a sector uh, past 18. Okay, okay, okay. You, you could pat, patch it to do so, yes. So the bonus... But, that, but then you wouldn't be within what would be compatible with your regular um, stuff either. Yeah, the, the advantage of OS 9 is that you have that header sector at the beginning of every disk you format that tells the operating system, okay, here's how many sectors per track I have, here's how many tracks I have, here's how many sides I have. So basically, it just reads that and goes, oh, I need to do this, and it just runs. Okay, Whereas so, RSDOS is hard-coded yeah. for 35 <clears throat> tracks single-sided. Wayne, I think you need to add me as a friend first, because I can't add you to this call that's already going on. So I see Wayne's trying to call me right now, but I think you need to add me as a friend. And, uh, yeah, so this might be a little bit more technical than I'm able to do right now. Um while well, stuff's going on here. But I see you trying to call me. I just, I can't answer that call. I don't even know how to like click on your name and make you a friend right now, Wayne. I'm, I'm not that Skype savvy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you can try setting it up for the next, next week or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. After you eat. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Food is calling. <laughs> but yeah, no, this, I think this was a good talk. This was, you know, I have, I had a lot of challenges this weekend. Um, I had to reformat my PC and um, I lost a day yesterday because we spent five or six hours at a um, 
at a, a family, you know, family party type thing down the street. So I lost a, I lost pretty much a whole day yesterday to make any progress. And I was literally working on my computer up until, you know, 20 minutes before go live time to get all my software reinstalled and everything out. So it was, it was like a last minute thing to get everything up to the point where I could even do this talk today. And for not having a lot of time to prepare, I, I think it was a pretty good talk. <laughs> yep. I think the only real issue you had was the pause key uh, yeah. triggering your software. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I am, uh, yeah. But yeah, not bad. So yeah, we'll just, and Nick Marentis has just joined us back. So yeah, let's wrap up this week. we got plenty of things to talk about next week. Um, uh, yeah, you need, to, you need to like go to contacts and search for contacts and then put in my name, OG Stevie Stro, and then I'll see it and I'll accept it and then I can add you in. It's a little bit of a process there, Wayne, but we'll get you here. Um, we get some new blood into the talks here. Uh, I, I definitely on my list uh, to expel is Curtis Boyle and David Ladd. I will throw these guys out in a heartbeat to let anybody else in this call. So, hey, <laughs> listen here, bub. <laughs> He's just jealous of us, David. Oh, yeah. yeah, I am so jealous of your extra two tracks on your floppy. <laughs> well, Dave, Dave will just create a new personality anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> he will be. Yes, Paco O shamed Tay because he was shamed out of the group. So, <laughs> uh, good times, good times. All right. Now there's got to be a way to add. Or if so, tell me what your Skype ID is, Wayne, and I'll try to add you too. We can we can maybe do it in reverse where I can pull you in that way. All right. Any any closing remarks? Anything you guys want to talk about? Uh, something else you're working on, or something that we might be able to show off next week? Some teasers for next week's show. Has there been any updates for the uh, Tandy Assembly? Uh, that's a good question. Has there been any updates for the... Well, in a way, there has been. Good good question there, Grant. Let me switch over to the Tandy Assembly site. We'll pull up the site real quick. One of the things that, um, that you can do now from the Exhibitors tab, they did release the floor plan, and there is a... You can now fill out the form. You can download a form... And, and apply to be a visitor and an exhibitor in advance. It's looking like the early bird price to do that is thirty dollars for a for a table, and I believe that exhibitors also includes your your entry to the uh, to the fest. Um, and I believe there's a limit of limit of tables too. There's like twenty six tables available, so they do have a floor plan, um, and and that is. That is part of it. Uh, who are who is the speakers right now? I think we, I think the speakers haven't changed too much, but um, I should I should mention on the speakers there. We didn't mention it last week when Lance Nicholas was there. He's actually done Coco stuff too. Um, he did some work for Adventure International, doing some stuff for the Coco. Uh, the one I like the best is the Star Trek Three, uh, which is one of the best Star Trek simulators. Uh, he okay. did that work for the Coco. Okay. So yeah, I guess it's still going on. And there, you know, we're gonna have we're gonna have Tandy Assembly. We have some, we have some actual speakers lined up right now, and they, you are able to get an exhibit, um, to get an exhibit table now. You can pre-register and save ten dollars off of that. Um, who who is an exhibitor? It's anyone who wants to display a computer, an accessory, software, hardware, or any. Artifact from Tandy Radio Shack computer history exhibitors may be vendors looking to sell their Tandy computing related uh, products or may just be hobbyists wanting to display their work for others to enjoy. So um, that's kind of the working uh, thing right now. So that's probably the latest thing. What I haven't heard on is I've saw some mentionings on Facebook like can you reserve a room and get the block rate or get a standard rate as a Tandy assembly rate just yet that I haven't heard of, but I don't think there's anything preventing you from either just calling the facility directly and reserving this <clears throat> or using a travel agent. I'm probably going to use my travel agent and book the room and book a rental car. Cause we're going to do a, we're going to do a road trip to this one here. The um, last I heard is that the, the original blocks was not released right off the bat. So some people were trying to reserve and they weren't what they were going like what cocoa block, but apparently that was fixed this last week and now they, it's official. You can just ask for the cocoa rate or the, the tiny rate. rate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And do we know what that rate is? Uh, Jim's in the chat. And he just said you can. It got fixed on Monday. So he probably knows the rate better than me. <clears throat> there it is. It's on the page. Okay. So here's the dates. 
We have a block of rooms available for a discounted rate of $89.95 for Thursday through Sunday nights. The rate is good until September 5th. Mention Tandy Assembly when making reservations. So there we have it. So the block is official. Yeah. And so I think if we've learned anything about this, for somebody who was new to Cocoa Fest, do you want to stay over Sunday night? I would say yes. Now, what I'm planning on doing is... Um, we're going to probably drive up all day Friday. And so from from where I'm at in Florida, it's about a 14-hour drive. But where Michael Brandt is at, it's about a 12-hour drive. So I'm probably going to drive up Thursday night, crash at Michael's house, and then Friday morning we're going to take the 12-hour drive and be there, you know, uh, Friday night. And then um, we'll have all day Saturday and Sunday. Definitely stay over Sunday and then um, drive home Monday. That's kind of my working plan right now. So I'm going to have a rental car basically from Thursday through Monday. But um, I'm thinking with this one, if we can split the cost of the rental car, split the cost of the room and everything else, this might be pretty affordable for Michael and I to, to cut all this down because, you know, for airfare and hotel was about 600 bucks for me to go to Cocoa Fest. I'm hoping this is going to be considerably less than that. And then you, or by splitting it in half, at least be considerably less than that to make it a slightly more affordable trip. Um, so, yeah, but I'm definitely looking forward to going. It is, um, you know, it's the first ever Tandy Assembly. And, uh, you know, history will be made. Good question, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're feeling better. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. It yeah, was definitely yeah. a definitely a rough week, so but I'm almost a hundred percent. I think you got to read the book. <laughs> yeah, and the book was really good. And that was another thing too. We ought to get uh uh Boise on here sometime. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. We I mean we've had him we've had him on once to talk about stuff, but yeah, we should it would be great to, to get to uh, well, Boise and Bill LeJudas as well, because both of them worked on it. That would be great to talk to them about it. Now, they, they have been interviewed for like the Floppy Days podcast and things like that. So I'm sure there's there's stuff out there where we could listen to and, and, and hear some of that information. But it'd be great to hear it from them firsthand and do like a live Q&A, too. Um, yeah. Well, Boise worked in microwear and stuff, too. So you can kind of get into that yeah. part of the background, not just yeah. the book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I mean, I learned a lot reading that book. Just uh, there's so many things that you just uh, you would have no idea to know. Basically, what a bunch of freaking penny pinching scumbags <laughs> they were to make these machines. Is every chance you can is how how hard can we squeeze this nickel into the buffalo excrements? You know what I mean? It's just like it's all about uh, <laughs> it's. And on the one hand, you got You got to figure what drives innovation. You know. And in this case here, it was the almighty dollar where they basically said, sure, you want to engineer a new machine? That's fine. As long as it costs us less money. If you can save me money, then go at it and make a new, better chip. And something has to drive innovation. In this case here, it was budget, you know, and it's hey, really Steve? impressive. Yeah. Uh, have you ever heard Marty Goodman's term for those guys? No, no, no. <laughs> He called them Cretinous Chimpanzees. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's too bad we can't get Marty on. I'd like to have him live again. He's, he's a fun guy to talk to. Wow. So, yeah, it was a great book to learn some of the history, uh, even just learning some of the history of how Tandy started before they merged with Radio Shack and everything else. And one thing uh, I should mention, there was another history done years ago. I think the guy's name was Alfredo Santos. And he kind of covered a little bit of the Tandy stuff, but he also covered the history of third-party hardware and software developers for the Coke. And he kind of had a timeline from 1979 till 1993 or something. I know Frank Swaggart published it, I think, in his uh, mm. World of Six Eight Micros book too. Um, that might be something Cocoa to actually Chronicles? go through because a lot of people don't know that either. Yeah, the Coco Chronicles. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, Wayne Campbell just pointed something out too that I think was kind of a kiss of death for the Coco 3 in a in a bit. Coco 3 came out right around the same time that the Tandy 1000 was out and 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 that was the future. You know, MS-DOS and everything else as we know, that's 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 the direction that the world took. Um, and so I, because Tandy had these two products, they were almost going to be competing with themselves. And if the Coco 3 was too good, um, then that's less Tandy 1000s that they could possibly sell. But again, Which is a higher profit margin. A higher profit margin, probably, right? So, um, there, yeah, there was really, 
you know, it was really a lot of corners were cut. It's really impressive when you look at it now what the Coco 3 can actually do and the fact that the Gimme um, was a custom engineered chip that gave it all its extra features that didn't exist and that was an in-house design thing. That's really impressive. And these are the things that I did not know at all um, until I read that book. I uh, just was not aware of you know, the hardware behind it, the politics behind it, the process behind it. So it's a great book. You would love to get those guys on sometimes to, to get more into that history and hear it in their words and stuff. Um, might be kind of cool to get together not only Boise and Bill, but maybe some of the other people they interviewed too and have the whole team together. That'd be really cool. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so those would be things that we can talk about at Tandy Assembly. You know, we can talk about not just the Coco stuff, but Tandy went, that was my second computer. You know, my second, you know, I went through a few different Cocos before I jumped onto the Tandy 1000. Um, but yeah, it's part of my history too. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to Tandy Assembly. I think it's going to be cool. Um, yeah, good times, good times. But we'll save some of this. We're going to, we're going to, put this in a bottle right now so it doesn't go stale. We want to keep the carbonation and all this cocoa um, uh, enthusiasm here and we'll keep it fresh for next week so we can crack open another uh, you know, nice bubbling talk of cocoa <laughs> excitement <laughs> and hopefully we'll have some more projects to talk about. Hopefully by next week I will have released uh, a, a, a main video that's not confusing and not interrupted by pauses in the stream. I'll try to keep a concise, simple, step-by-step Here's how to get MAME installed and configured as a Coco. I haven't officially done that video yet. It's on my list to do. Um, you know, uh, what else? There was something else you said we should talk about, Curtis, too, which we'll try to do really quick here. But it was um, the discussion about the 256 color mode in the Gimme. And, oh, right. and, and, and Steve Bjork had mentioned something in the Facebook um, group that there was no way it was going to happen unless it could cost less money than the Coco 2 and the only reason why the Coco 3 was released was a cost savings over the Coco 2 and you know we know corners were always cut um, but yeah so there's been the talk of this 256 color mode coming out of the gimme for a long time and is it a myth is it a unicorn is it a you know was it, it only in the prototype stages you know so does it exist i want to believe <laughs> yes i want <laughs> to believe so um you know i think the true now now one of the things that alan huffman alluded to which i don't know if this is top secret knowledge but there there were we do have in possession the original prototype machines and i think right now alan got them at coco fest and i'm not sure who alan's giving them to but he's giving them to someone where the, what the prototype was able to be done will be determined at some point in time. Yeah. There's also an Ethernet card from that and a few other things, yeah. too, so, that existed. So, so, and I believe, because I think Microware had access to some of the prototype machines. Well, they had uh, the big, the big, you know, massive um, breadboard where the Gimme is actually a whole bunch of different chips. It's not even a single chip yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the original spec sheets from Tandy to Microware, which are published, you can see mm -hmm. them, uh, actually does mention this mode being in the original design spec. But according to Steve, because of cost issues, it was cut out. I mean, Mark Siegel thinks, at least when he was interviewed by Nick back in 97, 98 or whatever it was, he said it was still in there. It was just kind of hard to get to. And then when Bill and Boise interviewed him 10 years later, it sounds like he'd kind of changed his mind and he didn't remember it still being in there. And Steve is kind of definitively saying, no, it didn't make the final production machine. So I still don't know. No. Yeah. Okay, Eric. So Darren says, I think Eric has the prototype right now. Eric, Eric Gavriluk, is he the one who would have it right now? So it is possible to reverse engineer that and determine if there was if the feature and 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 there's no reason to believe why it wouldn't have existed on a prototype because the prototype is where we think we're going and this is like you say this is the design spec this is what we want to do however when it goes time to roll out to production the almighty dollar is going to dictate what the final build of materials is going to be and that feature might have gotten squashed to save money um <laughs> So the truth, the truth is out there. The truth will be determined <laughs> at some point in time. Um, and, and Rick Adams wants to believe. <laughs> so we all want to believe. So um, and, and it's definitely something that uh, I think with projects like the Coco FPGA and the um, the the um, Darren. Gr oh, what's what's the other one called? I get all these names confused right now. So there's. There's Coco FPGA and there's Coco on a stick, um, or Coco on a chip. So some of these things here might be able to implement some of these features. 
um, in a more hardware accurate way where it's not just some new bonus super feature. Um, so, and, and Ed Snyder's new gimme might be able to unlock a feature like this in the future. So, mm-hmm. the ability for us to take advantage of this is is not out of reach. If, if this so, disassembly of the prototype actually reveals if the mode was there and how to physically access it, and if Mark's original assertion is correct that there is a hidden way to still get to it, then the new gimme, if we can emulate that, then it would actually work with the old machines too. So. But uh, I I suspect it's probably not in there in the original. Yeah. All right, well, that that might be something we can report report on as you know the weeks go by as we discover more information too. Is the two hundred fifty six the elusive, the unicorn mode as we'll call it. So. <laughs> yeah, Nick has a really good blog post and all the research him and Sock did in trying to find it. Yeah. Based on that interview with Mark. Yeah. Good deal. Mm-hmm. Good deal. All right. Well, I guess we will wrap up this week's Coco Talk. I want to thank everybody who's here now and those of us who were with us before. We kind of came and went. And um, always something always something good to talk about when we have Coco Talk here. So that's nice. Even when we don't have a big plan, um, things happen. And that's a beautiful thing. So We have plans? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we'd just come with this stuff right out of our touche. <laughs> yes. So for those of us who are remaining on the call right now, for Grant and David and Mark and Curtis and Bill and Nick and Rick, thank you all for being here. For those of you who were with us before, thank you for being here. Let me see if I can acknowledge some people in the chat without missing anybody this week because I missed John Linville last week. So yes, Curtis was here. Michael Brandt was here. Richard Cavill was here. NML32 was here. Michael Brandt. Um, Eric Hancock was here. Grant was here. Um, Ed Snyder was here. Richard Lorbieski was here, both on the voice call and on the chat call. Tim Lindner had stopped by earlier. And 6809E was here. Mr. X Roar himself was here. And um, Bosco was here. Uh, who else was here? Wayne Campbell joined us. And who else joined us here? Uh, Tandy slash Darren Grant joined us. And Bob. Bob Fazmike, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right. So Bob Fazmik had joined earlier and says, I just got back into Coco via your channel using emulators. I had a Coco 116K back in the early 80s. And then Bob says, doing some basic along with your channel tutorials. Will you be covering machine code, namely um, routines called from basic? I told him that I eventually plan to get to that. He said, thanks. Um, and have I missed anybody else? I think I've gotten everybody. Retro Innovations had stopped by too. Jim Brain talking about um, how the rates were fixed on Monday and it's eighty nine ninety five plus tax for Tandy Assembly. Um, very good. I think we got everybody. I think I've acknowledged everyone that I can remember. And for those of you who I forgot, I apologize. So that's it. Another great week of Coco Talk. Getting ready for Tandy Assembly, getting ready for more projects, you know, looking forward to more blog updates from Nick and Glenn Hewlett and everybody else working on projects, looking forward to hearing more and seeing more from what Rick Adams is working on. I cannot wait to try out this 20-track floppy myself. I swear, I swear to God, I'm super excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of sarcasm. Just a bit. <laughs> Steve, so, uh, there's no reason to be sarcastic about it. It's useful, man. We haven't even told them yet you can put extra tracks on some of those, too. Uh, yeah, some three and a half, up to 85, but oh, commonly, man. normally, 82 to 84. You're getting me excited. <laughs> and the best part is is that all of this extra space is used by OS9. So. <laughs> exactly. <The> real awesome. <laughs> so, more used to squeeze more crap onto a floppy. So, <laughs> yes, Bob, thank you for stopping by. Very cool. All right, guys, we're gonna end this nonsense for one for one week, and we'll have more <laughs> nonsense next week. So, uh, Coco forever. <laughs> thank you. All. Later. We'll see you next Goodbye, week. Goodbye, y'all. Bye, bye. <laughs>